Okay, Your Worship, all delegations are in and their video has been stopped, so you can carry on. And thank you for your efforts, Mr. Larmer. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, Monday, June the 1st. I'd like to call the committee of the whole meeting to order. Um, uh, I know our time is slightly off. To let you know this is done by electronic participation, Zoom video conference applications, and to also let you know that uh, this shall form part of the record which will be retained according to the Town of Coburg Retention Bylaw. If you have more information about the collection, we ask that you please contact Mr. Larmer as part of the Municipal Clerk's Office. With that being stated, I'd like to go to our Deputy Mayor for agenda additions. Thank you, Your Worship. There are seven agenda additions this evening. Memo, first is a memo from the Interim Chief Administrative Officer, Treasurer, regarding the unfinished business item, radio frequency meter replacement program. The second is a memo from the interim chief administrative officer treasurer regarding the Victoria Hall sandstone and front door repairs. Third is a memo from the municipal clerk manager of legislative services regarding advisory board committees and quasi judicial boards participation through electronic meetings. Fourth is a memo from the planner one heritage regarding the Second Street Rainbow Crosswalk in Colbert. The fifth is a memo from the Deputy Director of Community Services regarding Colbert Community Center CCC summer camps. The sixth is a memo from the Manager of Marketing and Events regarding the Marketing and Events budget update. The seventh is a memo from the Manager of Marketing and Events regarding the Town of Colbert virtual community events. The action recommended that the matters be added to the agenda. A discussion from members of council. Councillor Charlie. Um, I just wanted to remind council of procedural bylaw section 11.3, which says that additions to the agenda shall be restricted to time sensitive and emergency matters. I think some of these issues are time sensitive. Some of them are not. I was wondering if the clerk could just clarify whether members of the public have the opportunity to present as delegations on any of these additions to the agenda since they were added uh, quite late on Friday, I believe. Mr. Larmer? Uh, Sarah Rush to the member of council. I'm, I'm, maybe I'll need the question repeated, but we didn't receive any delegation requests for any of these items. They were published on Friday as part of the republishing of the agenda, just like the special meeting um, was republished. Um, again, this is a committee of the whole meeting, so a lot of these things have to come back to regular as well, so they'll republish that way. Um, but um, they they were added on Friday um, to be additions to the agenda. Uh, Councillor Chorley, uh, subsequent question? Yeah, I would note that the deadline for registering as a delegation is 1 p.m. on a Friday. And um, I'm just concerned that we're falling into a little bit of a pattern of having lots and lots of late additions to the agenda. I note that on May 11th, we had 11 additions to the agenda. So some of these I think are urgent and council needs to look at them, some of them are not. I would suggest that item one is not urgent and should be uh, uh, dealt with on another agenda. And I'm open to any other feedback that members of council have about the other items. So just to be clear, you're suggesting, you're requesting item one be removed, is that what I'm hearing? Unless it's time sensitive or an emergency, I think in accordance with procedural bylaw section 11.3, it should be dealt with at a subsequent meeting. Uh, Mr. Davey, I see your hand up. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Your Worship, I have no problem with uh, deferring that memo to a subsequent meeting. It was just that um, it was published in many um, prior agendas that that report would be coming back on June the 1st. So. That was why I uh, rushed it to get it on to uh, tonight's agenda, but it, it certainly can uh, can wait. Okay, thank you for that comment. Any other comment, uh, Councillor Darling? Yes, in regard to that issue, um, as the CAO mentioned, it has come back to, has been at several meetings. Um, the CTA made a presentation, asked for uh, um, answers to their questions. Um, the answers to the questions were forwarded to council and accepted by council at a, at a, uh, at a meeting you know, subsequent to the January 6th meeting. So, I mean, everybody was well aware that this was coming. I received a couple emails in regard to this issue. Um, I figured that if anybody had it, 
uh, wanted to comment, they would have. But it, I mean, if the rest of the council feels it can be deferred, uh, I would like to see it remain on the agenda so that it can be brought forward. So that uh, if it, if the issue does go forward, that the uh, Lakefront Utilities Water Department can can get this uh, ongoing and uh, complete the work that they're requesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Barrow. I'm gonna actually I agree with Councillor Torelli on this. Um, I do have some questions in light of the new hydro rate, the new all that, on how that would affect. So I would like to have um, also some questions that I, I honestly didn't have time to answer uh, over the weekend. Um, so I'm okay with deferring this as well, since the interim CAO says he has no problem with it. Okay, any other comment from members? Uh, Mr. Davey, I see your hand up. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Your Worship. Again, the, the only point to this memo was to clarify for council, um, <clears throat> Would the borrowing by Lakefront Utilities of 2.3 million to go ahead and uh, finish up the water meter project would that be in place any due hardship on either uh, property taxes, the town of Coburg budget, uh, the town of Coburg's ability to borrow, um, any of those issues? So it's again, it's it's nothing to do with whether the replacement of the meter uh, all in one was a good idea. Um, whether that report is a, that, that stands on its own by uh, Lake Trent Utilities and their management and their board of directors. So again, this was um, an item of uh, information purposes for council, just so that they could clarify that Lakefront was not wishing to borrow $2.3 million from the town of Coburg and in no way would it impact um, our decision. So that was, the, again, it, was a, it wasn't really a decision item as much as it was an information item for council just to, to clear it off their list of requested items. Okay, thank you. Any other comment? Councillor Darling and Deputy Mayor? Yes, just uh, just along with Mr. Davey. I mean, we've had a lot of these issues on the uh, unfinished business list. Um, due to the COVID, staff has been very, very busy. Um, the date for having it come forward was June 1st. Everybody knew that it should be coming forward on June 1st, this report. So, I mean, Mr. Davey went out of his way to get this report to us and then to turn around and defer it. Um, what's the sense of having a date on the unfinished reports when the reports come forward and then we defer them? Thank you. Okay, again, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just as a follow up, um, I think we do need to stick to our procedural bylaws as close as we can. I know emergencies do come up, but uh, and Mr. Davies says it can be deferred. It certainly can be deferred as the orig originator of the report. And it will give all of us on council time to um, read this carefully as opposed to just, uh, you know, with all this been going on the last few days. So I'm in favor of deferring it to the next committee of the whole. Okay, thank you. Any other comment, Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, while I know it was added late, I do see how I have to agree with Councillor Darling on this, that it's a continuum of information we've received in the past. Um, I was able to read it over the weekend in addition to multiple other briefs and emails coming in, so I didn't find it too cumbersome. I do find it's on a topic and if it was brand new business item for sure, but because if it's a continuum of information we've received, um, and I think there's other proponents waiting for direction on this. So I'm happy with it remaining on the agenda. Okay, we've had enough discussion unless there's anybody else. Councillor Charlie. I would just say that as members of council, we've probably read this report even though it was added late to the agenda. But um, the reason there is the 10 day rule that every item that's added to our agenda is meant to be published 10 days in advance of the meeting is for the benefit of the public. It's a transparency and openness measure. And I think it's very important that we adhere to that as closely as possible, regardless of the state of emergency. Okay, uh, it's before us uh, for the removal of item number one. It's clear before you on your agenda. I'm gonna call those all in favor, against. Uh, the motion is defeated. The agenda item will remain as number one. Any other comment before uh, on any other matter? Okay, thank you. Any disclosure pecuniary interest members of council? 
Very well. Should we just have to vote on the original motion to add to the agenda? Oh, I apologize, Mr. Larmer. The original motion. All in favor? Against? Carried. Are there disclosure of pecuniary interest members of council? Seeing none, I'd like to proceed to the Mr. Larmer to presentations. Yes, next year, worship, we have presentations and we have a presentation from the County of Northumberland regarding the Glo Golden Plow Lodge, GPL, and Northumberland County Archives and Museum redevelopment project and update. And your worship, Jennifer Moore is on and a number of other county members. I'm sure she'll reference in their presentation. Well, Jennifer, you're no stranger to uh, Cobra Council Chambers. Uh, I look forward to your presentation as does council and it looks very informative. And thank you for introducing the different guest uh, speakers along the way. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mary Henderson. Uh, so as uh, I, I think everyone can, can see from the presentation, uh, we're, we're pleased to be here this evening so that we can provide a, an update on the Golden Plow Lodge redevelopment project, as well as the uh, Northumberland County Archives and Museum that'll be a component of that project. Uh, and of course, part of that is the uh, formal request for um, transfer of, of Courthouse Road. And I, I, I think that's all hopefully information that everybody's familiar with, but we will go through um, in more detail just where we're at with this, this project. So uh, we have been working on the redevelopment for quite a few years now. And uh, we're now in the very final stages before we start construction. So we felt it was timely uh, to come and give uh, our, our, the members of Cobra Council a thorough update. So um, as you know, I'm Jennifer Moore. I'm the CAO of Northumberland County. Um, Jerry Pilon is, is here from Salter Pilon Architecture and he will uh, be my co-presenter this evening. Uh, and also on the call, we have Northumberland County staff members. We have Mo Canoe, who's our Director of Transportation, Waste and Facilities, Mark McIntosh, who's our Manager of Major Projects, and Kayla Essegayer, who is our Project Engineer. They're all working on the project, and as well, we have Ryan Stitt, who is with the architectural firm. So uh, Jerry and I will do the bulk of the presenting, but of course, everyone is here to answer questions um, if uh, we require their, their assistance for some detail. The presentation, uh, if we could have the next slide, please, Brent. Um, the, the outline will just take us through a little bit of background. Um, you'll get to see uh, a bit of a, a sneak peek at uh, what some of the, uh, the design looks like. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the schedule and outline, as well as some of our consultations with the neighbors uh, and our next steps over the coming uh, weeks and, and months. So for the next slide, please. Uh, so the history, I won't go into the history because it is very long and, and uh, goes back many, many years, uh, almost two centuries. There has been a facility operated on the property and for the, the history buffs that are among us, uh, I'm sure they can, can give you all of the details on how uh, the site has evolved over the, those decades, um, starting it with the, the House of Refuge and Beacon today being a long-term care home. The new home will be built by 2022 in order to meet our funding requirements. Um, and as uh, many of us are aware, the county's demographics are that over a quarter of our population are over 65 years. Um, and as our population um, ages, the needs and complexity of care continue to increase. And the residents that we have caring for uh, at the home today are certainly um, much different than the residents that we saw only um, a, a couple of decades ago. The new Golden Plow will continue to provide our residents with high quality resident focus, focused care. Um, this is a philosophy of care and this is really where um, all long-term care homes uh, are moving. It's an been an important part of our community for, for many, many years. Uh, and the new building is really critical to ensuring uh, that we can continue to provide a, a safe and caring uh, an environment for our residents. Next slide, please. The Northumberland County Archives have also been in our community for a while. Uh, the county did uh, assume uh, the uh, Coburg District Historical Society Archives a few years ago. Um, that is currently being operated out of the Coburg Public Library. Again, as, as many of you probably know, um, that space, um, it, it, we're just outgrowing it. Uh, there isn't, um, uh, it's not suitable anymore for um, the type of services that we would ideally be able to offer. Uh, we're seeing more people come in, particularly with things like genealogy and and people touring around to get to get out to uh, see their family history and, and often that brings them in, into our archives. Uh, for the next slide, Brent, please. Uh, and you can see some photos uh, in this slide. There, there's a lot of items that we just aren't able to 
um, display. We don't have an exhibition space in the, in the current archives um, space. We don't have a lot of uh, reading room for uh, visitors to come in and access the resources. And we have many things that are simply not out on display and can't be accessed by the public like we would like to see um, with a full archives and museum facility. And the next slide, please. And this slide, uh, I will actually turn it over to Jerry. Jerry will walk through the next few slides. As I said, it'll give you a bit of a peek into what uh, we're proposing the new facility is going to look like, the design, uh, and some of the details. So now I'll turn it over, uh, Jerry, uh, away you go. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, your worship, members of council, uh, I'm assuming I can be heard here. Um, my intent here is to kind of go through at a high level and give you some background to the project that we've been working on with the uh, with North Lebanon County. Um, the existing facility, as you can see from the slide deck, is 151 beds, 100,000 square feet. Um, the, the redevelopment project will bring this uh, project to 180 beds with an increase in 200,000 square feet, um, as well as adding the uh, archives and museum to it at a 6,000 square foot program level. Um, one of the things that, that is, should be mentioned is that we are pursuing uh, LEED Silver certification for the project, um, which is for um, sustainable design and, and energy conservation. Um, as you can see from the slides, obviously it was, the project's been around for a while. It was initiated in 2016, and uh, I believe it was initially presented to the, to the County Council in 2017. Um, we've been on since 2018. Um, the, the project itself is envisioned in three phases. Um, the first phase will be the actual full construction of the new Golden Plow Lodge Archives and Museum. Uh, that will allow us to get the building built and commissioned, at which point we will we'll then uh, decant residents from the existing GPL and move them into the new facility. We will then proceed with phase two, which is demolition of the existing GPL as it stands today. And then once that work is done, phase three will be the site remediation and the campus uh, site works for, as part of the overall development. Uh, next slide, please, Mr. Lomer. Um, I think you're familiar with the site location and, and where we are talking about it uh, happening. As you can see, um, the existing Golden Plow Lodge uh, resides to north of the existing county uh, headquarter building there on the site, with a large green space. In the center of our site is Halcyon Place. Um, so we are looking at a design that basically tries to envision this as, a, as part of an overall uh, county campus facility and looks, looks to do what we can do to um, build a new facility in the multiple phases that we've, we've alluded to while maintaining access and services to all the other uh, facilities and, uh, that are a part of the overall campus site as it currently stands. I have next slide, please. Um, in, in terms of the, the site plan that you see before you, um, it, it tries to graphically show you what uh, you can see as the outline for the existing GPL facility and Halcyon Place and the, and the uh, county admin building. Um, so you can see just from a graphic representation what the, the scale and size of the new facility is going to be. So it is rather significant at 200,000 square feet. It's a three-story uh, building with a, a lower service level. And, uh, you know, it tries to take advantage of obviously the, the, uh, the green space that exists now currently, and then we'll try and evolve it in the phases that we've discussed previously. Um, the, the visitor parking lot is to the south, um, north being to the top of the page here. Uh, with staff and service areas to the north. Uh, the intent, as I said, is to develop it as a campus facility. So the intent will be to have walking paths that tie themselves into the network of, of things with the town of Coburg already um, to allow for pedestrians to move about as well as residents and family members on the site. Um, and then we've also been in close contact with, with the neighbors as well as Halcyon Place. And, you know, we've looked at the uh, circulation on the site, bus stop locations and things like that. So our intent will be to put the bus stop uh, in, on our in new, newly proposed internal circulation 
across from Halcyon Place, um, which we think works best on the overall site as well. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, three-story building. Uh, when I, you see the term RHA, that stands for Resident Home Area, which is a Ministry of uh, uh, Long-Term Care term, um, which, is, which is basically the, the kind of community housing grouping. Um, uh, so RHAs are made up of 32 residents uh, in, in different groupings, which is allowed for them to have different uh, care and supervision in their own little clusters and groups. And then those RHAs form part of the overall home. So it's basically considered a part of a, an overall residential community. Um, programmatically, we, um, you can see the, the bottom left corner in the slightly salmon pink color is uh, where the archives and museum component is. It's right near the front door um, of, of the, the GPL. Um, and then there is a, a, a kind of north-south spine, I guess we'll call it, which we call our main street. And there are two of those resident home areas that are clustered around that, that main street to allow for these smaller grouping and communities to be built around that. Um, one of the units is actually designed as a special care unit, which is for a higher level of care for uh, residents with um, uh, dementia care and, and other issues. So we have basically also looked at how we design these clustered around these open courtyards, which is to provide um, access to natural light and amenity space for residents, but also to reflect upon the security requirements that the residents will have as well. And then those floor plans basically repeat themselves on level two and level three. Next slide, please. Uh, this at a high level just will try and show you the different types of resident rooms. Um, the, the facility itself is, is premised on using a thing, uh, room types called basic rooms, uh, semi-private rooms and private rooms. Private rooms are uh, self-explanatory Semi-private rooms basically share a washroom facility and the basic rooms uh, uh, share a washroom facility and an entry and vestibule and are they're separated by a, a physical wall and then a divider curtain. Um, so it's basically all in accordance with the current ministry long-term care guidelines and we're divide, you know, detailing to that as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to give you a high level view of the archives and museum. Uh, once again, as stated, 6,000 square feet. The intent is to have a access point between the lobby of, of the um, uh, Golden Plow Lodge and the archives museum while maintaining independent access to the archives, but also having the opportunity for shared functions and services as needed for both residents and, and, and others that are using that facility. So uh, it, it seems to work well in terms of an overall component to the project. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of design and sustainability, I think I mentioned the project's targeting a lead silver designation. Um, so this basically goes beyond the basic Ontario Building Code and Ministry of Health and, and County Standards on Energy Performance. Um, so specific attention uh, through the design has been spent to thinking about how resident staff comfort will be addressed um, as well as making sure we address the ministry guidelines. From a lead perspective, um, what we're really trying to do is deal with water conservation, energy consumption, indoor air quality, um, dealing with recycled content, um, construction waste management, all those things that really add to the overall quality of the project, as well as the quality of the project as it relates to a building being put forward in a community so that it, it lessens the um, overall um, energy and green footprint of the building that, that is being proposed. I can tell you that where we are today, uh, the building itself has been designed and is being modeled from an energy perspective to be 19.7% uh, more energy efficient above and beyond the OBC and ASHRAE standards that the, the building code calls for, which over time is just something that is, is a sustainable design target that, that the county has advocated for and that we've been able to, 
to implement through it through a series of measures and, and some of them are listed there uh, for you to see. I won't go through all of them, but it, it's the idea is that the building itself becomes something that we recognize that the existing GPL has been there for uh, a long time and we think that the the um, energy and, and footprint that it's going to leave uh, there is going to be for another hundred years and we should be responsible for that and be cognizant of it and, and design responsibly and that's what the county's asked us to do so we've implemented a lot of those measures going forward next slide please the next few slides are just some uh, rendering images that we've developed uh, as the designs evolve. Uh, I guess um, some of them may be hard to see um, but in detail, but I guess the palette of materials that we're trying to use is one that's trying to initiate a sense of, of warmth and, and welcoming, uh, which is what Golden Plow Lodge is all about. Um, our focus is a lot of glass and natural light, which we think is, is a vital part of, of, of making sure that it's a pleasant environment for residents and staff and, and family that visit the site. Um, so we've got large covered portals uh, that, that will allow us to have people dropped off and visit and, and, the, and the buses and things like that to come by and deal with residents. You'll see green roofs that are part of our sustainable strategies. And then as, once again, lots of natural light uh, with the glazing. If I could have next slide, please. This is just a different view, uh, not the nighttime view, so it might show a little bit more. The view you're seeing is of the main um, uh, access point with the main entry canopy uh, and the front entry. Uh, and then the piece to the right is actually where it is a uh, uh, the multi-purpose room, which is for not only meeting of residents and everyone else, but to be a shared resource for the county, uh, which we think is important. I should also mention that uh, one of the energy saving measures and, and the sustainable strategies we're doing is we actually have um, uh, energy uh, uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. There are five that are part of this project as well um, as, as part of our lead strategy, which are just on the other side of that, that canopy. Next slide, please. Um, this is just one of the uh, courtyards, which is in between the two uh, resident home areas that we looked at on the plan earlier. And the idea is that we just create lots of opportunity where residents can have views to the outside. So the spaces you're seeing in the middle there to the back of this are where dining areas actually open up and look out to a courtyard and, uh, and look to the west, uh, which we think are important just for overall resident quality of life. Um, next slide, please. These are the ones that are well, quite honestly, more architects speak than anything elevations. I'm not sure anybody really under wants to understand or knows what they are, but they basically try and tell you that um, the story of this is to show that from the on the top image on the right side is the elevation where it is a grade where the front ent front door is for uh, Golden Plow Lodge, and if you follow along to the left and go back. It shows where the uh, we're trying to take advantage of the grade and elevation change on the site to have a service level that comes in at the back for shipping, receiving, and, and things of that sort. So that's that's really what these drawings are intended to represent. Next slide, please. And once again, same idea, moving left to right this time, showing the gradient change uh, of what we have and going from there. So at this point, I think I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jennifer and I'll let her speak to all the other points. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, we'll just quickly go through the next few slides, cost estimate and schedule. I know everybody always is, is curious about um, the, the cost. Uh, of course, we, we have been uh, sharing this already. So the, the cost of construction will be about 80 million. Uh, with the soft costs, it's about a $100 million project. Um, the design is being finalized. Actually, I, I think we're saying it, it is pretty much at 100% now, um, just awaiting the final approval of the ministry. Uh, we've already pre-qualified the general contractors, electrical, mechanical, and structural subcontractors. This was really to try and expedite the process when we went out um, to tender this summer. Uh, you can see from the, the timeline where we're at currently, 
Uh, we're getting very, very close to starting construction. Um, if all goes well, we will be out to tender in another few weeks. Uh, and then that will see us uh, begin construction um, late summer, early fall. Um, and then that will take us through to moving in by the end of 2022. Uh, and then uh, as, as we had mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, that we'll see um, the demolition and site works completed after that. Next slide, please. And actually we can go to the next one as well. Uh, one of the things that we know, um, we've had a number of conversations with staff about, and there's they're certainly interest, is, is how we have been working with our neighbors. Of course, this is a large project uh, for the community, um, and it does uh, it will it will see uh, in, in neighbors being being impacted to to different degrees. So the neighbors that we have met with um, is Church on the Hill, and of course we know what uh, representative is on the call this evening. Um, Halcyon Place. Uh, there's a retail building at uh, 1000 Elgin Street, um, and there's a residence uh, on Elgin Street. Um, so those have all been part of our discussions very very early on. Um, I did have a preliminary conversation with a representative from Highland Shores Children's Aid. Um, they, they said they were supportive of the project, but because the impact is very, very minimal uh, to them simply being next door, they didn't feel that they needed to talk to us any further because they would not have any direct um, changes to their property at all. Next slide, please. Um, consultations with the town of Coburg. Of course, this is uh, where we started um, way back in, near the beginning. Uh, so 2017, um, we had started to meet with the town at a general level to talk about concept. Um, uh, the previous CAO, Stephen Peacock, was certainly a big part of those conversations. Uh, and then we've continued working with a number of members of town staff, and many of them are on, uh, on the call tonight, um, that have followed through with the project and provided input along the way. Uh, and it was through one of those early conversations that we did talk about the county ownership and, and ultimate closure of Courthouse Road or a portion of it. Uh, and, and that is now a big part of how this project can move forward. And that's been incorporated to into the design with all of that collaboration. And uh, we'll, we'll thank um, Mr. Peacock for um, that, that suggestion in how we could see um, a, a greater use of the campus and, and looking at the properties which were to the south of Courthouse Road at the time. Next slide, please. On the next couple of slides, again, are very similar to some of the ones early on in the project, but just to give you uh, a sense of um, the placement of the redeveloped GPL, the existing GPL, um, and where the neighbors are located. So you can um, see there <clears throat> where the existing building is, the, the county headquarters, the retail and the residential property both facing onto Elgin, the, the street on the left-hand side, and Helsing Place, of course, is in the, the very center of the overall campus property. Next slide, please. What we're proposing is that you can, of course, see um, the, the new building from the site plan that you had seen earlier. Uh, it becomes um, moved to the opposite side um, in, in repositioning. Uh, and you can see that in relation to Halcyon Place. You can see that this envisions that Courthouse Road is no longer there. Um, it provides direct access to the church and retail through what is currently the, um, <clears throat> the west leg of Courthouse Road. Uh, and then you can see that the current residential property, which is um, contemplated to be redeveloped at some point in the future, um, it, it does face on onto Elgin. So the next slide, please. The consultations that we've had to date, uh, we've had a number of meetings with Church on the Hill. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, contemplated that there would be a driveway to Elgin. Um, I will say that I, I did have a brief conversation with a representative from the church um, last week. Um, and I, I did advise that we're still looking at other options and we know um, the driveway was one of their concerns. We are contemplating an option um, <clears throat> where there could continue to be uh, municipal county uh, ownership of, of the roadway um, and, um, and see if that would alleviate some of the concerns there, but still allowing them with the same access they, they have today. Um, Healthy in Place, we've had uh, a few meetings with them as well. At this point, we're working on the final legal documents um, with uh, just negotiating some, some final items. Overall, they've indicated that in principle, they, they're quite supportive uh, of the project and we're, um, we're just uh, hammering out a few details about um, some parking enhancements and, and things along those lines. But, but overall, we're, we're pretty much there to, to an agreement. The business on, on Elgin, um, again, we've, we've had um, initial meetings and um, we have not had any further uh, concerns raised by them and, and we'll look to proceed with the final agreement there as well. 
the residents on Elgin, as I said, it's contemplated that it'll be redeveloped at some point in the future. Uh, we have come to uh, an agreement um, in principle with um, some final negotiations on uh, how we envision um, an entrance in the future. But um, other than that, um, pretty much agreed with uh, how the product, uh, project will uh, impact their, their property. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a rough uh, reference plan, uh, and I will say for the staff uh, participating, we received the, the final reference plan um, at 5 p.m. today. So that will be forwarded shortly. I see I got a smile out of Glenn with that one. Uh, so it is, it is on its way. We, we have just uh, received it. But this gives you uh, a, a bit of a, an orientation. I know it's uh, small on the screen, uh, but you can see how it is proposed uh, that there will be uh, easements as necessary and legal agreements put in place so that everyone retains full access and legal right to those access to that access to um, their property uh, in the in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So the submission status, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we have had uh, we have submitted uh, the design. Uh, on a couple of occasions now to the Ministry of Long-Term Care. Um, we're waiting on the second set of formal comments. We believe that's in, imminent that we will receive those. Um, all of the previous comments have been addressed in the, the current design. Um, so we're, we're hoping um, with the COVID and, and working from home, um, I think there's been a, 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 a bit of time uh, in getting response back from uh, ministry staff, but they've been very cooperative and we anticipate that, that we should have that uh, very soon. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been working quite closely with the town of Coburg as well, and we're working on revising our drawings as per the second set of formal comments that we received as part of the site plan reviews. Um, things have been very co collaborative there and progressing, and in, in my understanding is that most of those items have been sorted out um, with just a few uh, minor ones that, uh, that will be uh, ironed out shortly. Uh, next steps will be to finalize again as uh, we, uh, we get that ministry approval and, of course, um, site plan approval from the town. Um, as I mentioned, uh, finalizing ownership of Courthouse Road as is contemplated in the site plan is part of the reason for this evening's presentation. Uh, we hope that we will follow shortly thereafter with um, tender for the, the project construction um, and uh, we'll continue over the next number of weeks to finalize uh, the relationship with neighbors um, as it will, will impact them and make sure that we are minimizing those impacts as much as we can and see this move forward um, for, the, uh, for the summer construction. Uh, and we'll go with the final slide, please. Uh, this is the, the, the contact information. You can see Mark McIntosh is the project manager. Uh, we do have uh, an email set up for the project and there is a web page with updates so that we can continue to share information with, of course, the resident, resident families and the, in the broader community. Um, and before I wrap up, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of attention on long-term care homes in the media um, over the last um, couple of weeks in particular, and, and certainly throughout um, the entire uh, pandemic. And the, the, the current staff at the Golden Plow Lodge have done a fabulous job. Um, they, they really um, have done um, just, just fabulous to keep our residents safe uh, and comfortable throughout what's been a very difficult time. Uh, but when we go through an event like this, it really does highlight um, the need for uh, a, a, new, a new building and for that building to be redeveloped. Um, the new design certainly uh, incorporates many things that, that make it much easier to react and respond um, during um, this type of, of an outbreak or, or a lockdown situation as it, as it might be for our residents. So um, we've certainly um, experienced firsthand just uh, how critical it is that we do redevelop this project um, and see it, it move forward. And it, more than ever, um, we can see that the need for that. So um, that finalizes our comments. And of course, both uh, Jerry and I and the rest of the team would be happy to answer uh, any questions. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, questions from members of council? Uh, starting with Councillor Charlie. Uh, thank you both for the presentation. I think the design looks really attractive. Um, the question I had was really about the impact of the pandemic on long-term care homes. Do you anticipate any changes from the ministry in terms of guidelines for the design of this facility um, in reaction to the way long-term care homes have been devastated by COVID-19? I'm just looking at um, the design of the rooms. I see there's a lot of shared rooms, for example. 
um, whether there's video conferencing equipment so that residents can stay in touch with loved ones if there's any kind of a, a lockdown um, ventilation systems. I'm just wondering, are you anticipating changes uh, coming out of the lessons learned from COVID-19? We, we've oh, actually, oh, oh, through, through, through you, Mayor Hudson, uh, we've actually had a number of, of those conversations over the last few days. Um, and and we, that, that's certainly been top of mind. Uh, the new building certainly, <clears throat> I think, addresses many of the, the challenges that, that we have to have had to adapt to in the existing building. Um, even where there is a room that is shared, um, there's certainly much more, um, a lot more space and, and the ability to, um, to isolate residents uh, if need be. Uh, I think Jerry might may be able to speak to some of the other more specific like ventilation, that sort of thing. Um, video conferencing, I think that uh, we do need to be, be aware of, of um, the, the health and cognitive ability of some of our, our residents and um, the, a new building will have much more technology incorporated into it. Um, but there's also a lot of other features that um, are able to keep residents comfortable, entertained and, and active uh, in the event of a lockdown. Um, so maybe Jerry, you have a little more to add on the um, particular design or, or vents or that sort of thing. Uh, sure, I'm happy to do so. Um, I think one of the things we should mention is that, that the building is designed a, as a, a, a brand new state-of-the-art uh, long-term care facility. So it has all of that infrastructure and everything available to, to ensure that residents have the ability to be connected and, and with family and everything else should something like this come out in the future. I think the other thing I'd like to mention though is that um, early on in this process in, in, in discussions with the county, um, there was a conscious decision made to standardize the uh, resident room areas and make sure that there wasn't uh, a, a real discrepancy between the resident areas between uh, basic, semi-private and private. And the ability to, for this building to be able to adapt um, and modify itself to add additional uh, separation and you know over time morph into more private uh, rooms and things like that can be done quite easily based on on the steps and the, the decisions the county has made to this point. So I think from that perspective, I think we're in a good position with the design that's been put forward with the ministry. Um, in terms of air handling and systems and everything else, um, we meet and exceed all of the uh, criteria for air handling systems, air exchanges per hour, all of those things that are required um, to a healthcare standard. There is a CSA standard and guidelines for all that work that we will exceed as part of part of our overall design. So I'm confident that what's being built here and, and promoted by the county is something that will be a, a state-of-the-art facility that, that will um, more than address those concerns going forward in the future. And it's, it's, it's probably gonna be a welcome addition to the county for sure. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Barrault. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and also thank you to the county. This is such a great building and, and definitely needed. Definitely the extra beds. And what I do like, especially is the sustainability part of it. If I heard correctly, it was 47% above the provincial standards. Is that correct? I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that to bring back to the committee. Is that anybody? Uh, I'll leave that to, to Jerry to, to clarify. Okay. Uh, through you, Your Worship, I, what I'd like to say is what we are is uh, the building from an energy consumption point of view, energy conservation is 19.7% more energy efficient uh, beyond the OBC requirements and ASHRAE standards from the current code. Uh, which overall means, yes, you're getting closer to like a 40% a standard, but it's 19.7% beyond the ASH rate in OBC. Thank you for that. Can I do a follow-up, please? I don't see another hand. Go ahead. Um, next. Uh, the places that you're in consultation with, the Church on the Hill and, and so on and so forth, are, you gonna, are they going to be... Um, on board with this before you actually start the project? 
Uh, Jennifer, are you taking that? Okay. Yes, I will. Uh, yes, th that's why we we have been been having meetings with them. Um, the the intent is that we would be able to finalize um, those before the start of construction. Uh, we will. Um, we're hoping to go, as I said, to tender in another few weeks. Uh, it'll take a number of weeks um, to get the tender um, submitted, reviewed, and, and awarded. Uh, so we're hoping through the summer that we will finalize. Um, agreements with each one of, of those neighboring properties. Um, like I said, most of them are, are very close and we've been working hard um, to, to make sure that we can address the concerns um, of, of all of them as much as we possibly can and continue with the project. So yes, we're hoping that through the summer before the start of construction, um, we'll, be, we'll have been able to um, come to terms with everyone. Okay. And if not? Uh, if, if not, then I, then I think that that becomes, um, uh, again, negotiating there, there's way there's to, to move forward. Um, we're, we're hoping that um, it's a bit of give and take and that number, none of the neighbors would, would look to um, go through a mechanism such as the courts where they could try and prevent such an important community project. We, we hope that um, everyone understands there will be some impact. We're trying to min minimize that or um, in, in some way compensate for those impacts. Um, as much as we possibly can um, so that it is fair for everyone, uh, understanding it'll be a, a change in some cases for the neighbors, um, but hopefully they'll see benefits in other ways. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? I'm looking around members of council. Councilor Charlie? Um, for my own understanding, I was wondering if you could explain why the old Golden Plow uh, building couldn't be renovated or expanded and why you decided to opt for a new facility instead. And also in terms of the destiny of the old building um, being demolished, can you just explain why you chose to demolish it? I have heard from residents who suggested that it could perhaps be repurposed into some kind of housing or possibly affordable housing. Can you explain why you chose not to pursue those options? All of those options have been reviewed and considered um, over time. Uh, the, the current building, um, as was mentioned, it, it simply reached end of life. Uh, so there have been cost estimates done on what it would take to bring that building um, up to, to today's standard with respect to HVAC, electrical, all of those um, functions that are, that are um, important to the building. The costs were very, very substantial. Uh, and then we would still be left with an, an old building um, with a layout um, and those sorts of things that simply don't meet today's standards. So the ministry has very specific guidelines, um, the size of the rooms and, and the, the configuration, the number of residents in a resident home area and so on. Um, they simply don't meet today's standard. And with the, um, the way the current building has been built over the years, it was an original structure with a wing added, a wing taken down, another wing added. Um, so it doesn't have um, the flow, it doesn't have um, the functionality that a current modern long-term care home would have. So to repurpose as a, a long-term care home or simply upgrade um, would be um, cost prohibitive and we still would not reach the standards that we need. It would also have meant that residents would have been displaced during that period of construction. So um, that one simply didn't function. Uh, when we looked at the construction of the building, there's the three main wings right now. Each wing was built in a different era with a different type of construction. Um, most of those uh, types of construction, if we were to start to renovate and try and turn that into some sort of a housing unit, uh, in some cases, it's simply not possible because um, you know, it, it's uh, load-bearing walls for very small rooms. Um, you would not be able to, in any cost-effective way, try and turn that into affordable housing. Um, and again, it'd be a very old building that wasn't designed for that purpose. Um, the cost of it would be uh, extensive um, and it, we, we didn't feel that it was the best use of, of taxpayer dollars to try and take something, um, the age of the plow and, um, and the, the different methods of construction and try and repurpose it. We've looked at other uh, properties, you, you know, that we're, uh, have already announced that we intend to redevelop um, our housing and trying to intensify um, at Darcy and Elgin and looking at other properties where it's more um, suitable to try and use county properties for affordable housing um, rather than take the old GPL and try and force fit it into something that it was really never intended to be. Okay, thank you. 
any other uh, deputy mayor? Thank you, Worship. Uh, Jennifer, just looking at the increase of beds by only 29, yet the square footage has doubled. Um, I know there's a big need with the demographics in not only Coburg, but Northumberland. Um, was there, why was, what was the decision, I guess, in, in the past years to only increase by 29? I know you're limited by what the ministry says you can increase um, your population. And a follow-up to that is, um, how, how does one get on the list to uh, get those extra 29 beds? Not that I'm on the list just yet, but, um, you know, the 151, I'm guessing you're at capacity now. But I'm just wondering, that, that seems like such a small number when you're doubling your size. So I, I, I will go through. There's, there's a, a bit of a story and, and a history there. Um, of, yes, we, we are certainly um, at capacity. Um, we do have all, all 151 beds um, are, are filled uh, and there is a, a, a wait list um, like most long-term care homes. We don't administer our own wait list. Um, that comes through the, um, what was the LIN, um, you know, of course they're going through their restructuring there, but um, that, that is managed um, externally to us. Uh, and we're certainly, um, we, we, we are advised uh, which residents um, are, are coming into our home, home next and, and there is a process for that. So um, we, we don't get to pick who, who's the 20, on the 29 beds. Um, it is a running joke about how you do get to pick at which room you want, um, but knowing full well that none of us uh, re really get to do that. Um, the 29 beds, uh, the, there is some logic behind uh, moving to a 180 bed facility. Um, the recommendation um, and guidelines from the ministry are that maximizing your resident home area is 32. So this is um, five times 32. And then the other uh, 20 beds is for our, uh, our secure unit um, where there is the enhanced security. And that's typically where um, those with uh, dementia and, and other um, mental health challenges would, would be located. So um, that's how we get up to the 180. Um, that is um, really to, to maximize how we can deploy staff, uh, how you can um, orient shared dining rooms and, and have those mirrors um, and, and that sort of thing. So it works out to the total of six resident home areas. If we were going to further increase size, we would have had to apply um, in additional increments of 32 in order to again, maximize staffing. Um, and that would have seen our home um, expand quite dramatically. Uh, and you have to weigh the pros and cons to um, losing that sense of how you manage your home, the feeling of home versus an institution uh, and, and how we wanted that to, to feel for our residents and the resident families. So um, that was really balancing that and, and how we landed at the 180. Uh, and then of course the ministry did have to approve that request for 29 beds. And there is um, some discussion about whether beds are allocated to municipalities, nonprofits um, or private sector homes. And of course the ministry balances that as, as well. Um, the size that's really, um, you know, Jerry could, could assist with, with more detail, but largely um, the, the scope of the facility uh, and, and what the, the ministry guidelines are today are quite different than what they were when the, than the current home is built. So the, the space per resident room, um, what's required for common areas for, for dining and lounge facilities, um, what we need for storage and those sorts of things that we don't have adequately in the current facility, um, uh, resident activity areas and all those sorts of things. So um, all of that is, is what's led to the additional square, square footage. Thanks very much. Any other questions, members of council? Seeing none, Jennifer and uh, Jerry, thank you very much for an informative uh, presentation. Mr. Larmer, back to you. Yes. Uh, next, Your Worship, we have a delegation of Reverend Dr. Ewan Butler, lead pastor from Church in the Hill, regarding discussion on the proposed changes to Courthouse Row, the County of Thumbland, specifically the impact of Church on the Hill, his congregation, and others. I'm just going to invite him in to make sure. There he is. Hey, Reverend Butler, uh, welcome to uh, Clover Council in a virtual format. Uh, we look forward to your delegation. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, um, for uh, inviting me or allowing me to uh, make a brief presentation. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, uh, Reverend Ewan Butler, lead pastor at Church on the Hill. It used to be called Glad Tidings Church. And um, 
uh, we've had some time and some discussions over the last uh, two or three years and had a long time to consider some of the impact of this uh, wonderful facility. I mean, impressive facility that I'm sure we all, um, we all look forward to seeing. But we do have some concerns, being the most westerly neighbor, I guess. Um, Cordes Road, as most of you know, or some of you would know, uh, is a shape of a crescent with, um, with entrances meeting Elgin Street. Uh, on a hill, both entrances have inclines, the steepest on the west entrance, close to the church, uh, and the east, of course, um, by the county building is less, less steep. So over time, the county's plans uh, to rebuild the Golden Plow have evolved and roads, road, road access and traffic flow proposals have changed significantly since the beginning of the project. Um, the county's most recent plan divides Courthouse Road into two unconnected driveways. These driveways uh, would not be official roads. Uh, the plan shows the top of the hill being used for guest parking spaces. The major concern that we have and uh, all of our people would have would be it creates serious safety and traffic flow concerns for the folks who attend uh, the church for those who use our facility and uh, potential financial and liability issues for the church. What essentially happens is that the church ends up with one way in and one way out, and that's not the end of the world, except it's on a steeply graded hill, which exits onto a very busy street. Now our church, our sanctuary has a capacity of 350 people. Sunday attendance is around 200 and midweek family night is attended by a good portion of that 200. Special events, uh, concerts, funerals, weddings, uh, sometimes put us near capacity. And we have support groups and not-for-profit groups who use our building for meetings. And so traffic flow and tri driver safety is a big concern. Um, here's what happened, what happens and what has happened over the years. It's very common for drivers, and I'm not sure what the percentage would be, but it would be quite, very, quite high to opt for the east entrance to follow the crescent around to the church coming from the, uh, uh, particularly coming from the west because of the availability of the left turn lane on Elgin Street and this lane offers drivers a safe place to pause when traffic is heavy and when winter conditions are at their worst. With the current plan, we would lose the option of entering Courthouse Road using that left lane. Um, and as I said, during the winter, drivers often choose the east entry for safety reasons. The grade is less steep and of course for traction and things like that. Uh, also, you know, we've been used to Courthouse Road being well maintained. It receives priority snow clearing and uh, we're on a bus route. And because because we share a road with the Golden Plow, where accessibility is essential. And this would be lost um, uh, if cut off from the rest of the, the street. And so concerns for safety arise, considering uh, driving conditions and exiting and so on. Uh, and let me just say here to clarify that uh, the left turn coming out the west entrance to, to uh, Courthouse Road is increasingly becoming difficult. And for me as leader, it sometimes gives me nightmares to think of all the left turning traffic making that exit going east, coming out of the building on a Sunday morning or any time when you have a funeral or anything of that sort. Um, so retaining two exits would ensure a more orderly evacuation of our parking lot, particularly in the case of back-to-back uh, -back events, funerals and so on and particularly in case of a fire or other emergency. And we're concerned as well that, you know, we have neighboring business that would share the church's only entry and exit route. And then oftentimes this business receives deliveries by truck, intermittently transports, try to navigate the road or back into unload, make it impossible to bypass them. That doesn't happen every day, but it does happen. And so being occasionally blocked in should not be an option, particularly in case of an emergency. And it's important to note that the county's original proposal ensured up until last year ensured a second exit for the church. It would have been to the north of our property and that proposal uh, with some of the revisions have, has been withdrawn. So in a letter we wrote to county in March, we asked that they consider their plans to close Cordes Road. And this was our rationale. Leaving Cordes Road as it is in the shape of a crescent would accomplish the following. The preservation of our local history by retaining Courthouse Road 
uh, historical road going back to 1807, home of the old courthouse and so on. Uh, no address change for those on the street, businesses, senior residents, church and county would not have to go to the expense nor the administrative load of changing addresses. No one on the hill would lose that second exit, which is a little bit of a lifeline. Um, there would be uh, no concerns about being blocked in, etc. cetera. Uh, drivers who may be looking for a shortcut could be informed with proper signage that there's no through way with directional arrows diverting traffic to continue on the Crescent back to Elgin Street. The road would continue to be county maintained and as a result, there'd be no loss of services, no downloading of costs to the church, uh, which operates of course on donations. Um, concerns uh, including snow clearing, maintenance, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so on. Um, the ownership scenario that the county proposed would mean that the plowing, maintenance, infrastructure, liability, insurance would be re the responsibility of the church. This was the most recent discussion. However, uh, it is true, just within the past few days, I spoke with um, CIO Jennifer Moore on the phone. She informed me that the county is willing, as she said earlier, to uh, relook at some of those concerns. But still, the, the overriding concern is still the traffic flow and safety and accessibility. And so to conclude, let me just say this, it seems to us that the county can have both, the exiting west and east exits of Cordos Road and guest parking for the Golden Plow. Our church has served our community for 85 years, 43 of those on Cordos Road, it's a necessity that we retain two exits because of the elevation in order to ensure safer traffic flow and well-maintained access for our senior drivers, young people, neighbors, and other community groups. So as you analyze the details of the Golden Plow uh, site plan, we ask that you ensure that those using Cordos Road will maintain the historical access that has been provided these many years. It's our hope that you will advocate on our behalf and on behalf of those from the town of Coburg who attend Church on the Hill and its facilities. It seems possible to us that this project could still accommodate those two exits in the interest of safety and traffic control. And so we trust to your goodwill. And let me just say one other thing. Um, the rebuilding of the Golden Plow is going to result in a greater portion of the hill being now owned by Northumberland County, but Church on the Hill will still be part of the town of Coburg. And so the traffic flow, road safety, access concerns, particularly with increasing traffic flow on Elgin Street, will affect the town of Coburg and its people at a very busy intersection, a very busy, busy section of Elgin Street. And so what was becoming a growing safety issue with that west exit is now going to be exacerbated significantly. And so I'm bringing these issues to you on behalf of our church to you, Mr. Mayor, and the council to ensure that they're considered before the final site plans are approved. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions, clarification members of council? Okay, seeing none, uh, again, Reverend, thank you very much for taking time out of your night. Mr. Larmer? Thank you very much. Issue of worship. I'm sorry, I missed that. Sorry, Worship. We're now moving into um, delegation actions. And I believe would that go to uh, our deputy mayor? Or would that go under roads? Ownership, General Garman? Are you looking to me, Your Worship? Yes, I am. I would say planning and development. Okay. But it's you to decide. That's fine. Planning Development, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Your Worship. I do have a short uh, recommended action, uh, assuming that it was under Planning and Development. So the action recommended is that Council receive the delegation for information purposes and further that a copy of the delegation and the Church of the Hill concerns be forwarded to Northumberland County and County Council for their uh, reference for future discussion. Hey, thank you. Um, any discussion? Uh, Councillor Darling? Yes, if I could, could I just ask that uh, Councillor B add that they also forward a copy of it to uh, our planning committee 
to make sure they have a copy. So when they look at the site plan and everything. Thank you. Are you comfortable with that, Councillor Beatty? I'm assuming you would be. Yes, absolutely. Count, uh, if I may, Councillor Darling, you're referring to PDAC. Yes. I do see that. Um, I may ask Glenn to comment, or sorry, my apologies, Director McGlashan, to comment on that, if I may, Your Worship. Yes. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. Uh, just for clarity, that uh, this is a site plan application that does not go to uh, planning and development advisory, as it already has uh, existing zoning approvals. So it would be a council approval of the site plan application. So bearing that in mind, then, Councillor Darling, because it won't be received by PDAC, are you okay for me to omit that from the motion? Well, I just wanted to make sure that Mr. McGlash with the site plan had a copy of the concerns so it could be addressed. Director if, McGlash? If you may um, wish to amend that, just to send it to the development review team, which includes uh, public works planning and other uh, agencies so they can all review. That sounds like a wonderful idea. Thank you. And Councillor Beatty, you're comfortable with that amendment to your motion? Yes. Or your your uh, delegation action, sorry? Yes. Thank you. Can you, you read it once to... more for us? Yes, I may. Action recommended is that Council receive the delegation for information purposes and further that a copy of the delegation and the concerns as outlined by Church on the Hill be forwarded to Northumberland County, County Council, and the Town of Coburg's development review team for their reference. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Against? Carried. Uh, Mr. Lermer, we're off to you again. <clears throat> Your Worship, next we have um, General Government Services in the agenda and Deputy Mayor, Chair, Deputy Mayor Sagan. Thank you, Your Worship. Oh, sorry, thank you, Mr. Larmer. Just about gave you a raise there. Um, the first item under general government is a memo from the interim chief administrative officer, treasurer, regarding the Victoria Hall sandstone and front door repairs. The action recommended that council award the Victoria Hall sandstone and front doors repair tender CO 20 17 MNT to Colonial Building uh, Restoration Limited in the amount of 275000 dollars plus non-refundable HST in the amount of $4,840 for a total of $279,840. I'll take any questions from members of uh, council on this report. Councilor Carling. Um, thank you. A question through to uh, Mr. Davey. Um, I noticed in this report that the second lowest bidder is being recommended and the lowest bidder I understand didn't submit all of the requirements. Um, I think it was insurance that was missing, but I also noted that there were invited bids and yet the lowest bidder was ruled out as being perhaps not as qualified as colonial building restoration. Could you just explain how that worked? Why with invited bids would another bidder be then considered um, not able to carry out the renovation. Mr. Davey? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, through the Deputy Mayor to uh, Councillor Chorley, uh, you're correct, it was through an invited uh, process. The uh, architects, engineering firm uh, Fishbridge Sheridan uh, did select, <clears throat> excuse me, six uh, contractors uh, that were invited to bid on it. Uh, this was our second uh, time at tendering this project and uh, you can see that their recommendation is that um, based on the body of work that these two firms have uh, completed in prior years uh, that their recommendation is the uh, bid from Colonial uh, that that be the accepted one um, we've also we have uh, tremendous uh, experience using Colonial in the past on Victoria Hall um, and it's just, um, it's just, that's both the, 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 uh, the consultant and our own um, recommendation is that Colonial is the better qualified to do the work. Any follow-up, Councillor Charlie? No. 
Okay. Um, no, no, I would. I have looked at Colonial's uh, website and the uh, projects that they've contributed to are uh, pretty extraordinary. So I can appreciate that. Any other questions from members of council? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. The next item is a memo from the Interim Chief Administrative Officer, Treasurer, regarding the unfinished business item, the Radio Frequency Meter Replacement Program. The action recommended that Council receive the report from, report from the Interim Chief Administrative Officer, <clears throat> excuse me, Treasurer, for information purposes. I'll take any questions from members of Council. Uh, Councilor Darling? Yes, in regard to this, uh, I've... Uh asked Mr. Larmer to, to look up the report from uh, Mr. Derek Paul of Lakefront Utilities, just to refresh all the council's uh, mind on, on regard to that issue. I've just asked if Mr. Larmer would forward an email copy of Mr. Paul's report, uh, the answers to uh, the CTA's questions in regard to the, the water meters. And I, I'm thinking, if I recall right, that. Uh, Mr. Paul's answers were forward to, to the questionnaires. I confirm that with Mr. Larmer. Mr. Larmer? Um, through you, um, Madam Chair, members of council, um, basically um, I've, I've just forwarded council the response. So at the January meeting, um, Lakefront Utilities, Derek Paul did provide some comments following the delegation from the Corporate Taxpayers Association. For that, was requested that that submission be in written form um, and be added to correspondence, which came on the February council meeting, which council received as correspondence um, relating to his comments that were at the actual um, meeting on, on in January. I think it was January 3rd. I have to see that. But um, yes. Um. Thank you, uh, Mr. Larmer. I see Adam Giddings has, has joined us. Do anybody have any questions for Mr. Giddings while he's here? Councilor Darling? I'd just like to ask, seeing Mr. Giddings is kind enough to join us, if he has any updates uh, on the budgeting or better interest rates or any information that, that uh, maybe some sort of an update on this issue. Um, I don't have too much of an update. Um... I believe the interest rates with Infrastructure Ontario have uh, decreased. Um, I mean, this report was prepared about a year ago, so based on the current economic environment. Um, I know speaking with Infrastructure Ontario um, last week, I believe their interest rate has, um, has decreased quite a bit. Follow-up, uh, Councillor Darling? No, no that's good, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Giddings? Um, I would ask uh, Mr. Davies, uh, this is just being accepted for information purposes, no decisions made tonight. Um, can I get a time frame as to when this will actually be coming to council for uh, discussion and decisions? Um, I, I don't have that information. I'm just following up on completing my end of the of the requirements. And well done it was. So thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. The third item under general government is a memo from the municipal clerk, manager of legislative services regarding advisory meetings and quasi-judicial boards participation through electronic meetings. The action recommended that council receive the report from the municipal um, clerk manager of legislative services for information purposes and further that municipal council allow all advisory committees and quasi judicial boards to be permitted to participate electronically via teleconferencing video conferencing pursuant to the recent amendments of the town's procedural bylaw when required through other council direction for input on a matter is an alternative way to engage and continue to perform advisory committee duties to assist the Municipal Council decision-making during the COVID-19 pandemic, public health, provincial and local state of emergency. I'll take any questions from members of council. Pretty straightforward, Councillor Torling. 
first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Larmer for helping to move this forward, because I think it's very important that we get our advisory committees up and running, since we do have the technology to do that. I have a very quick question for the clerk. On page five, you state that advisory committee meetings will be scheduled as needed with ample and a consistent amount of public notice provided. Could you just clarify how much notice you are planning on, pro on providing? Through you, um, Madam Chair, to Member Council. So typically we try to put public notices as much as we can forward um, on these. Uh, items and usually typically it'll be 48 hours prior to the meeting. Um, there are, I've separated kind of two parts to these. Um, I've cut, I've separated the um, non statutory um, committees, advisory committees, and more of a, a strategic plan and other um, areas of, of um, recommendation that council would like to see in advisory committees that have been implemented. So for example, Transportation Advisory Committee, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, Sustainability and Climate Change Advisory Committee have been separated from Accessibility, Cobra Heritage, and um, Planning and Development Advisory Committee, all to meet um, on an as-needed basis. So um, a couple of things is that what I place in the motion is that um, those committees I just separated out, um, the first one, so Transportation, Sustainability, Parks and Rec, um, would meet when council provides direction on certain items to meet. Um, so kind of suspend the regular process of meeting on a monthly basis. Um, so when that direction or that council is uh, motion or recommendations forwarded, um, right away we'll try to do the public notice period. And I'm recommending at least two weeks. And the reason for that is, is that um, we're using an electronic Zoom application process. So um, it sometimes can be hard to navigate the public, this new way of doing things. Um, these meetings are not streamed live, um, like regular council meetings, the ones I've just I've talked about. Um, so what we'll have to do is um, provide enough notice of how to, the public can participate because these are still public open meetings and the public should be able to participate in them and listen and request delegation status. So um, we will make sure we communicate that as, as much as we can. Um, because we don't have the capacity to um, someone just drop in physically and see them, not always do they see the notification or that public um, notice or these meetings um, being streamed and because they're not be held in a regular time. Um, I think it's poor, important for extended notice period for these meetings for that public can, but also we will record them and put them on our website. That way the public could um, see them. Um, this will be something that we'll have to make sure all members are comfortable with. They are public meetings. They're different than that, but that's how we would treat them. Um, in regards to the Planning Advisory Committee, as well as the Heritage Advisory Committee Accessibility, um, these are kind of statutory. They have their own processes for timelines and meetings that um, the Director of Planning Development and their staff do uh, mostly. So um, those would be situated on applications received and, and their processes going forward. But again, it wouldn't be a monthly basis to be at the call of that. Um, I think it might be important to know is that we'll provide as much notice to council too when these meetings are done. And, and I think the public will see now we've incorporated in our committee the whole meeting agendas, the minutes of these meetings, which is helpful too for people that are seeing that. And that will continue on as well. Um, but there will be a training process going forward on this. Um, I did canvas a lot of our committee members and they're really eager to get going and, and participate. Um, so. Um, they understand, though, with the climate that it's, it's you know, kind of um, an at necessary basis. So um, we have um, talked to everyone and they all are willing to use the video conference and understand it. There's a couple that will be using the telephone. So there'll be some training processes. So this is approved. I'll meet with all the chairs and all the secretaries and we'll go through best practices and how to go through it. So they'll be ready when they're called upon. As regards to the quasi-judicial, um, they have their own timelines and processes that they use. So that, again, that's through the, the planning and development um, department and the director. So committee of adjustment, for example, um, they're totally separate quasi-judicial make decisions on their own. Um, so they have their own notice period. You see that one just went out from the planning department. Um, so those are a little bit different. These are public hearings. So um, we actually will include in the notice, which is statutory notice, which the director can provide a little more update, but we've actually included the Zoom link as well as the meeting password, as well as the application for those in the public, and they'll be in the paper, 
um, can choose to come and hear that 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 application and they can participate at the meeting. So there's a little difference between the two there. Those will also be put up to YouTube and streamed live um, as well. So that'll be a, a good process because with those meetings, um, people or individuals that want to make a representation or comment um, will have the ability to watch it live and then actually access the meeting if they wanted to at the time of the agenda uh, or when the meeting's in process. We had to give them the ability to do that. So um, director can comment a little bit more on the quasi-judicial, but um, it's going to be our first shot at it, but I think it'll work fine because these council meetings, we've been doing the exact same thing. The only other part of that is that people would be able to join in during the meeting actually on, and we've given that notice to them as well. So um, I hope that answered your question a little long-winded, but um, I think it's important these new electronic presentation that we give a lot more notice um, than what we've done prior and the agendas are out a lot earlier. Thank you, Mr. Lara. That was an excellent overview. Did you have anything to add, Director McGlashan? Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Brent has, uh, Mr. Larmer has um, summarized that quite well. Mr. Larmer and I have been in consultation with each other and other municipalities um, throughout the county and, and other uh, jurisdictions. And uh, we feel that um, holding the quasi-judicial committee meetings as close to council um, in terms of style, format, um, Zoom uh, notifications and such uh, is the way to go. And like Mr. Larmer indicated, our notices will include all of the uh, Zoom contact information, not only web, but call in and passwords and such on them. So that's, again, very statutory. And, and we're actually just given um, timelines for when the newspaper is published and uh, the mail, uh, considering that the mail is maybe a little slower than usual. Um, we're adding about uh, seven, approximately one week onto uh, onto mail outs just to add to the uh, the time to give uh, to give people a chance to uh, to register if they wish or at least be aware of the meeting and tune in live so that's that's that aspect in terms of planning development and uh, heritage we typically have the agenda posted um, published po publicly at least five to seven days in advance of the meeting so there's certainly ample time for uh, for seeing what's on the agenda and contacting the secretary if they wish to attend. But, uh, that, that summarizes it, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. McGlashan. Uh, any other questions from members of council? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, I believe we're off to, through Mr. Larmer, to planning and development with Councillor Beatty. Mr. Worship. No, sorry, just finding my button. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. Just a note to Council, uh, you will have noticed that um, Mr. McGlashan had updated his report, his staff report, which was sent out uh, a few days ago. Uh, however, there, there, were, as a, there was a slight revision to the recommended action that is that wasn't replicated on the agenda. So I will be reading the recommended action under 2.0 in the staff report. Uh, this was published uh, to the public and council has received this and you should have reviewed it. So I will be reading the recommended action from section 2.0, which goes from page one to page two on the director's report. I am just going to pull up my split screen. Please bear with me. So item number one is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding a request for deferral of a building permit fees and development charges for Affordable Housing Solutions Corporation for 82 Monroe Inc. Number 2512464 Ontario Street Inc. at 82 Monroe Street. The recommended action, action recommended is that council receive the report from the Director of Planning and Development for information purposes and further that council approve the request by Affordable Housing Solutions Corporation, 82 Monroe Inc, 2512464 Ontario Inc, for a five year deferral of applicable building permit fees and development charges in the amount of $436,233.95 for the 35 unit market and affordable rental building located at 82 Monroe Street 
and further that council endorse the attached bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute a deferral agreement with Affordable Housing Solutions Corporation, 82 Monroe Inc, 2512464 Ontario Inc, subject to the finalization of applicable terms and conditions by municipal staff as specified in this report. And further that, council directs staff to prepare a report with a recommendation regarding the recent changes to the Development Changes Act, Development Charges Act, my apologies, as amended, wow, as amended by Bill 108, the More Homes, More Choice Act 2019 for council's consideration. Any questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Chorley. Um, I was wondering if Mr. McGlashan could just clarify, just to make sure that my understanding is correct. Under the new act, council has the option of charging interest on deferred development charges. Um, am I right in understanding that the, the draft bylaw we're being asked to approve, it doesn't include any interest charges? And I know that's a little bit tricky because um, part of this motion is that we will be asking you or staff for um, an update to help us understand those changes in that act. But is that correct that this bylaw wouldn't be charging any interest? Yes, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, Councillor Chorley. Yes, the uh, proposal would be to um, not charge interest on this particular application given uh, it is um, aligning with Council's uh, strategic plan objectives for the provision of affordable and rental housing. And um, it does certainly have merits to, to waive or at least not charge that interest in this particular case. Um, moving forward uh, with the changes to the Development Charges Act, um, there are a great number of, of items that uh, Council will certainly want to be um, aware of, in particular um, charging new community benefits charges for soft services. And that's, that's a separate issue entirely, but certainly one that um, warrants some attention. And also just moving forward in future applications or requests for deferrals, it's important for council to be aware of that, um, you know, for, for different types of applications, there may be areas where um, interest could be charged or uh, certain amounts of uh, consideration be, uh, be imposed for deferrals. So that's really um, for, generally moving forward for council to consider in, in the event that we'll get more requests for deferrals, which I think we might. And, but this particular application, um, Councillor Chorley is proposed to uh, not charge interest. Apologies, I can't keep up with my mute button. Thank you, Director McGlashan. Councillor Chorley, I believe I saw your hand up for a subsequent question. Just a quick follow-up question through to Mr. McGlashan. Do you think that the consultants who are working on the affordable housing CIP will be able to also provide us with some input or guidance on whether we uh, utilize that option of charging interest when deferring development charges? Through you, uh, Madam Chair to Councillor Chorley. Uh, certainly that can be um, something raised with the uh, consultants. What uh, we've done in the past when implementing uh, CIPs, for instance, the downtown, is that uh, interest uh, is not charged uh, on these particular applications as well. It's a similar um, situation under the CIP. So um, really that's um, um, a part, of, part and parcel of the affordable housing strategy is to reduce as much of the burden and, and obstacles as possible and uh, facilitate the um, you know, the, the provision of affordable housing in, a, in an economically viable manner. But uh, certainly we can raise that uh, at your request, Councillor Chorley, and um, I, certainly their financial uh, people as part of that uh, process can respond to. Thank you to both the director and Councillor Chorley. Councillor Darling? Yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Beatty. I just wondered, Mr. McGlashan, um, with a deferral for the five years, if I missed it in the report, um, at the end of the report, is it due, the full amount due at the five years, or after five years, are they put on a payment plan over another number of years? Through you, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, Councillor Darling. Um, so the um, 
the full amount uh, of the deferral would be payable after the five years. Uh, the five years would be, the clock would start ticking five years following occupancy, which we are assuming would be approximately upwards of a year before occupancy uh, of this building occurs. So, and technically it would be six years from today, uh, but the full amount uh, would be payable. There would be no further deferrals or installments after that. Um, as you could see in the report under the Development Charges uh, Act section that um, affordable and rental housing providers right now um, are allowed a statutory, actually a mandatory statutory installment plan over six years. And again, in that situation, municipalities may charge interest on it. So again, that's something for future consideration in the uh, upcoming report um, as part of the recommendation uh, moving forward. You'll also notice that the uh, provincial government in that act allowed for a 21 year installment plan for nonprofit affordable housing projects, which again, you may charge interest, but again, for the sake of economic viability and typically when, when dealing with uh, affordable housing and rental housing, um, some consideration for relief from all fees and charges, including interest are um, a major consideration. Thank you, Mr. McGlashan. Thank you to you both. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, uh, voting on the uh, recommended action read from the staff report. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Thank you very much. Moving along to item number two is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding an application for site plan approval for the development agreement at 1111 Elgin Street West Coburg for Trinity Northumberland Inc. Trinity Development Group. The action recommended is that council receive this report for information purposes and further that council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and be presented to council for adoption at a regular council meeting to authorize the mayor and the municipal clerk to execute a development agreement with Trinity Northumberland Inc., Timber Creek Mortgage Servicing Inc., and Lakefront Utility Services Inc. for the development of a 930 meter squared multi-unit commercial free standing building and associated parking service and driveway facilities at 1111 Elgin Street West, Northumberland Mall, subject to the finalization of details by municipal staff and applicable agencies. And further that council authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and be presented to council for adoption at a regular council meeting to remove the holding H symbol from the subject development lands. Any questions or comments from members of council? Okay, seeing none, calling a vote on the motion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you very much. And finally, item number three is a memo from the Senior Planner of Heritage regarding, my apologies, memo from the Planner of Heritage regarding the Second Street Rainbow Crosswalk Coburg. The action recommended is that council approve the heritage permit application HP 202010 as submitted by Lori Wills on behalf of the Corporation of the Town of Coburg and that this approval apply on an ongoing annual basis otherwise terminated by council, municipal council. I do would like to thank Lori Wills, Ms. Wills, Director Wills for submitting the permit for uh, ongoing future approval for the town as I believe this has become an important part of our pride commemoration and, and celebration. Uh, any questions or comments from members of council before I call the vote? Nope, straightforward, thank you very much. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Thank you very much, Your Worship. You're welcome. Off to uh, Public Works Services with Councillor Darling. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a memo from the manager of the Environmental Services regarding the pump replacement at the McGill, McGill Street pumping station. And the action recommended the council approve the purchase of a new Xylem pump at the McGill pumping station at a cost of $86,634, including non-refundable HST, to be funded by the approved 2020 Environmental Services Capital Budget. Is there any questions regarding regard to this issue? I don't 
have everybody on my screen. Yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, your speaker's not on. Just a quick clarification, Councilor Darling, you said 86,634 and I'm seeing 834. Sorry, Mr. Larner, if you can put that up again. You read 86,634. 86,834. Okay, yeah. if, I read, if I read six, that was my error, my apologies. Okay. No problem. That's it. Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Everybody's opposed, if any, none. Motions carried, actions carried. Uh, the second is a memo from the manager of environmental services regarding a new makeup air handling unit in the Headworks building at water pollution control plant number two, also known as WPCP2. The action recommended the council approve the purchase and installation of a new makeup air unit in the Headworks building at WPC, WPCP2 at a cost of $65,465 including non-refundable HST to be funded by the approved 2020 capital budget, environmental services. Do you have any questions regarding this issue? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darling. We're off to Parks and Recreation with Councillor Charlie. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Item one, memo from the Deputy Director of Community Services regarding Coburg Community Center summer camps. The action recommended that council receive the report from the Deputy Director of Community Services for information purposes, and further that council authorize municipal staff to cancel all planned summer camps at the Coburg Community Center, originally planned for June 29th, 2020 to September 4th, 2020, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? I just had one quick question through to Director Hustwick. Um, I noted, I think it was around May 19th that the Ontario Education Minister did announce that uh, the Ontario government was working on plans to open day camps um, I haven't heard any other updates on this. I'm just wondering if you've heard any updates from the Ontario government on when or whether that might be permitted this summer. Uh, Madam Chair, we have not heard any uh, recent um, uh, updates or provided any inside information. Um, I know everyone uh, involved in summer camps are actively working on procedures. Um, there's a lot of associations that are also collaborating and um, at this point, uh, we don't know when they may be allowed or if they'll be allowed. We also don't know whether uh, recreational facilities uh, would be allowed, uh, considering ours takes place in a recreational facility. And of course, there's also uh, um, staffing requirements that we would need to be to bring on board fairly soon to train. And then there's uh, those procedures. Um, we've heard certain um, uh, possibilities that there could be uh, like a four to one ratio of, of students to, to instructors. That obviously changes the whole dynamic. Um, uh, and we've also been uh, collaborating with the YMCA. They're also doing a lot of scenario planning and uh, are aware uh, that we may be canceling ours. And they're actively looking at uh, various facilities to accommodate pretty much every scenario if they're allowed to open as well. Thank you for your comments, Director Hustwig. Mayor Henderson. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair. The only thing I can add in our mayor meetings with MPP Piccini, I know the province is looking at this, I guess, seriously. The question, however, is what are the parameters and the safety and health guidelines working through Ontario Public Health? And the issue raised from mayors was if and when this program comes in, the concern is that a lot of these programs are often governed 
by community services, but also means a great deal of training with students who are hired as uh, summer ambassadors for the programs. So I can tell you there's great concern because no one's heard a definitive result of where this is leading. We also heard that this could take place in the latter part of phase one and potentially in the premiers for the start of phase two. The problem is we don't know what those dates are. So at this point, I can only say there's a lot of uh, indecisiveness in terms of what does this really look like for municipalities. Thank you for your comments. Yes, given the uncertainty around um, the Ontario government's rules regarding summer camps, I can understand the staff recommendation that we simply cancel them for this season. Are there any other questions or comments before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any? It's carried. Item two, memo from the assistant manager, Waterfront Operations, regarding the unfinished business item, response to delegation from anglers. This is referred from the May 11th, 2020 Committee of the Whole meeting. The action recommended that council receive the report from the assistant manager, Waterfront Operations, for information purposes. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? Um, seeing none, I would just mention that uh, the clerk was good enough to forward me some feedback from Roger Magnan, and Roger was the angler who delivered the delegation to council in September last year. Um, he did highlight a few issues that he felt were still outstanding. One was the option that staff presented, carded gate access to the boat launch. Um, another was potential discussions around additional signage and um, the nature of uh, ticketing violations for, for parking violations around the marina, as well as ongoing staff efforts to get bird droppings under control. So I just want to state for uh, Mr. Magnan's benefit that I will add some of these issues as coordinator of Parks and Recreation to my coordinator meetings and continue to discuss these issues with staff. If there are any projects which need to be brought to council during the 2021 budget deliberations, we can think about doing that. Any other comments before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any? It's carried. You can worship, you're muted. Apologize. Uh, again, thank you, Councillor Charlie. We're off to Arts, Culture, and Tourism Services with Councillor Barone. I think Councillor B, Councillor Berka has his hand up for it. Oh, did I miss Councillor Burkett for something? I yep. apologize. No problem, Your Worship. Uh, before we proceed um, to Arts and Culture, uh, Your Worship, I'd like to move to take from the table the resolution on bylaw number 025-20 regarding the potential introduction of a social distancing bylaw for the corporation of the town of Coburg during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would also ask for a recorded vote on this. And my understanding, Councillor uh, Burkett, if I'm uh, correct in uh, your terminology of motion to take from the table, it's simply um, just a majority of council. If they so agree, uh, then we can deal with the item and the clerk can correct me. And if somehow it doesn't receive a majority, of course, it is removed from the table. And I'll ask Mr. Uh, Larmer for clarity on the issue for all members of council. Sorry, you want me to explain the process? Yes, if you could, because I know this is, uh, I don't believe yet uh, to memory, we've, we've had this before council, at least in the last year or more. And I think it's always good to, uh, to uh, share the procedure with council. So first of all, we're this, um, Motion has to be seconded. 
Okay, seconder. Did you have a seconder, Councilor Burkett, or do I am I looking for one? I didn't have a seconder. At okay, moment. thank you, seconder. Anyone? I can't see a hand. For clarity's sake, I know I'm the chair. Uh, to put it on the floor, uh, Mr. Larmer, can I second or not as chair? Yeah, you can second it. Then I'll second it. Sorry, okay, so we seem to have lost Councillor Darling, I think. Do we lose, sorry, do we lose uh, Councillor Darling? Yes. Okay. So the motion is moved and seconded. So let me make sure Councillor Darling is back. So your worship, I can through you. I'm just waiting for Councillor Darling. Um, so there's you're the so we have to make a decision here. Um, we either I explain it. Um, we take a brief recess to get Councillor Darling back, or we go forward with the with the vote. I would prefer uh, if you could explain it. Maybe in that time he could get back. And um, and then that way, if we need to take a little break to ensure he's part of this, if at all possible, that would certainly be my preference since it's been requested as a recorded vote. Sure, so you worship to members of council. So a motion to take from the table, um, basically it's similar to the motion to lay on the table, just bring it back to discussion. Um, so um, a motion to take from the table is in order when there's no other motions on the table or the matter has been dealt with previously and it can be brought up at any time in the meeting. Um, but the motion can interrupt a speaker if it's on the floor. Um, obviously that was done appropriately. So the motion must be seconded. Um, it isn't debatable. So the motion laying the table is not debatable. Um, it can't be amended, requires a majority of vote and a motion cannot be, um, cannot be reconsidered. So just to explain a little further, motion laying on the table, if it is defeated, the motion, the whole item is gone, um, but there was no decision on it. There was no vote in favor or no vote against. So it could come back to council at any time, and then it can duly be voted yay or nay by council in that time. Um, thus, that's why there can't be a consideration vote on it because it's never been actually um, um, a decision made on that subject item. So. Strictly, this has nothing to do with the item. This is just the motion to put take from the table the motion that was placed on the table um, back in April 27th meeting. And I see Councillor Darling is back. And yes, thank you, I'm Mr. Sorry. Larmer. Um, I lost my Zoom there for some reason, lost everybody. Um, I, if I could just have that repeated. Um, Councillor Burkat's request, and if you could put up what he was asking to have removed from the agenda. No. So um, if you can, Your Worship, I'll explain. Um, sometimes technology, I fault him for that. Um, so basically, Councillor Burkat has moved a motion to take from the table, a previously tabled uh, motion, a recommendation that was put on the floor by council on April 27th and was put on the table. Okay. So, Basically, I'll just review this again for everyone, is that a motion to take from the table is to put it back for discussion by council. This vote is only on the motion to take from the table to put it back in discussion. Um, so the motion cannot be, uh, it must be seconded, and there was a seconder, was Mayor Henderson. Um, it isn't debatable, this motion to take from the table. It can't be amended, requires majority vote, and can't be reconsidered. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Um, once it, if it, this motion to lay on the table is either defeated, it will, it won't come back 
um, but the item can bring back forward another meeting um, because it was never defeated or voted in favor of. If it's voted in favor, council can consider the motion as if it was the same period in time it was back in April 27. Um, if it does get approved, the motion is carried. Um, what will happen is it will be back on the agenda and then council can elect what place in the agenda to deal with it, whether it's right away or postpone it to the end of the meeting. It's up to council decision, but first the vote has to happen on to take from the table and put it back to council for consideration. If I may ask, the motion was for social distancing? Yes, so your worship, if um, council Burke, I want to say, but basically what it is, it's um, the motion for the resolution on bylaw 02520 regarding the introduction of the physical distancing bylaw for the town of Coburg during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was one that was tabled on April 27th. Okay, good. I'm up to date. Thank you. And Councillor Burka has asked for a recorded vote. <clears throat> so, Your Worship, would you like me to take the vote? Yes, please. Unless there are other, for, sorry, unless there are other further questions, to members of council, for clarity only. No, nope. Mr. Lyman. Questions of clarity can happen. Okay. Thank you. So, Your Worship, procedural bylaw number 009 2019, section 23, where a vote is required to be recorded by law or request by a member immediately prior to or subsequent to taking the vote. Each member that is both present and qualified to vote shall announce his or her vote openly. And any failure to vote by a member who is not disqualified shall be deemed to be a negative vote, and the clerk shall record each vote in alphabetical order. When a member present requests a recorded vote, all members present at the council or committee meeting must vote alphabetical in an alphabetical order, unless otherwise provided by statute. The names of those who voted for and the names of those who voted against shall be noted in the minutes of the clerical meeting. The mayor shall announce the results. Councillor Nicole Beatty. Four. Councillor Aaron Burkett. Four. Councillor Adam Bureau. Um, Sorry? I'm not for it. No. Councillor Emily Chorley. Against. Councillor Brian Darling. Four. Mayor John Henderson. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzanne Sagan. Against. So it's four to three, Your Worship. The motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, my understanding, back to you, uh, if I may, Mr. Larmer, uh, Council can choose to discuss this now, is my understanding, on the protection services, or they can choose, my understanding, after we deal with arts and culture, to discuss it at that time. Is that correct? Yes, Your Worship. Um, yep. At this time, is there anyone averse to discussing it now since it's already under protection services, which in our agenda follows prior to arts, culture, and tourism? Councillor Burrell? Yes, if we could actually just do it after uh, this next one, we have. Um, Mrs. Uali, who is here waiting all night to, uh, if there's any questions, and it has been a long day. So if we could no just- means. I'm happy to do that. Is there any objection to dealing with arts, culture, and tourism? I see Ms. Uali is with us, and then coming back to under protection services. Seeing no objections, uh, we'll move to arts, culture, tourism uh, under Councillor Burrow. A uh, memo from the manager of marketing and events regarding the marketing and events budget update. Action recommended that council receive the report from the manager of marketing, marketing and events for information purposes. Is there any discussion? All right. Oh, Councillor Charlie. Thank you. I was just wondering if um, Ms. Ueli could just explain the leisure guide. Um, what's the status? Is there a need for a leisure guide this year? And as well, the students that serve as experience ambassadors 
could you just explain whether or not you feel we really need those student ambassadors? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to Councillor Chorley, um, with regards, I'll start with the leisure guide. Uh, so as you are aware, with the development of the division, the leisure guide was um, a goal um, for the marketing and events department as kind of a gift to the local community. So we initiated it last year. Um, it was, I believe, 42 pages long um, and within it it was a comprehensive look at all of the uh, community groups as well as local recreational um, and leisure activity program services what have you in the community. Uh, we are of course taking like everything else right now uh, it day by day week by week uh, we recognize that a number of the sports clubs and a number of the services that are included in the leisure guide may not be running this year. Um, however, we do just want to be careful uh, because a lot of those groups, uh, you know, as such, we're seeing that the CCC is not going to be running uh, camps this summer. A lot of our local groups are going to be struggling this year financially because they are not going to be able to run their programs. Uh, so much of the leisure guide is a look forward to the 2021 season, and it's a promotional tool for those local groups and clubs. Um, so just being careful and cautious with our decision because we don't want those groups to miss out on that opportunity um and we do want to you know now more than ever support local uh but we do completely understand that we just may not be in a place uh that any of these groups are ready for us to promote on their behalf either so uh we will be taking another look at it as the summer season goes on um ideally this is something we'd like to get out in August. So at that time, if it's really not looking like it's something that's going to be beneficial uh, to the groups, then we'll take another look. Um, with regards to the experience ambassadors, traditionally they do begin around May 11th um, and work until the Labor Day weekend. Uh, so now that we've had a little bit more time, um, so the stance that the town of Coburg has taken so far is that no summer students will be brought back on. Um, we know definitively that we've already got a group of savings. We had six students in the budget uh, for this year. So now that we're June 1st, we have already $7,000 savings from not having those students onboarded at this time. Uh, I don't predict that we will by any means have six students. Uh, however, in another a, a number of other municipalities, uh, they're bringing students on as ambassadors. Um, so not serving their traditional roles um, as tourism guides, uh, but to help perhaps by law enforcement or different groups just share information about perhaps closures in Coburg or different information um, there. So if we did bring on students, it would be at a much smaller number. All right, any other questions or discussion? All right, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Those against? It carries. Councillor Barry, you have one more. On the agenda, I got a, it's only the one. Oh, sorry. The uh, memo from the manager of marketing and events regarding the town of Coburg virtual community events. Action recommended that council receive the report from the manager of marketing and events for information purposes. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the vote. All in favor? Those against? Carried. My apologies. <laughs> Mr. Wally, thank you for your patience and being with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, 
Going back to protection services, uh, back to Councilor Burkett. Um, I copied the information down, is uh, now back on the floor for discussion. Um, any clarification as to do we wish to proceed to have that discussion tonight? So uh, per I'll just provide for information. So, Your Worship, the motion, thank you. the motion for the take the table was carried. So now it's back to, um, I've pulled up the April 27th meeting agenda with the motion and the action recommended, as well as the staff report and the draft bylaws. So it would just be like any other coordinator section of the agenda. Um, Councillor Burkow will proceed for that. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's a memo from the municipal clerk manager of legislative services regarding a physical distancing bylaw for the corporation of the town of Coburg during COVID-19 pandemic. The action recommended that council receive the report for from the municipal clerk manager of legislative services for information purposes and further that council approve and provide direction to staff to implement the proposed bylaw to promote and regulate physical distancing within the town of Coburg in order to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 to reinforce the importance of social or physical distancing as additional measure to protect the health and well-being of all residents within the town of Coburg. You're the chair. Oh, sorry. Uh, questions of from members of council, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Councillor Burkett. I appreciate you bringing this back forward. I have to admit, back in April, I wasn't as favorable to it as I am now, and the reason being, as we now live in a COVID world where the province is cautiously proceeding with reopening uh, the economy and public spaces, et cetera. And as much as I want to see an open beach for restricted purposes and to be enjoyed by everyone, from what I've heard from enforcement and other people who are concerned about uh, crowds and as we reopen and people becoming um, maybe not so mindful to physical distancing uh, as again as we reopen in a framework to my understanding you know the provincial regulations as amended do not prohibit the activities um, if we have non-restricted access on the beach beaching tanning picnics sitting on a towel playing etc and we have other open spaces it's just not the beach um, the west beach uh, parking lots victoria park uh, donegan park uh, of so many other public spaces. I guess what I'm getting to is these regulations um, uh, obviously have to abide by physical distancing and without, uh, or this municipal social distancing bylaw would possibly be a tool that our local enforcement could use if people refuse to practice social distancing. So on that frame, on that sense, um, again, in April, I probably wouldn't have been as favorable to that, but now as I'm digesting and understanding what tools we need to have to equip our staff and to keep communities safe and to enforce uh, some regulations in a reopening framework. I'm more favorable to the physical distancing bylaw now than I was a, a month ago. Uh, thank you, uh, your worship, and then Councillor Darling, and then Councillor Chorley, and Councillor Burrow. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Burkett. And I too am of the mindset of uh, Councillor Beatty. Mine's slightly different. Mine doesn't so much relate to the beach as much, but I know I was at uh, different independent businesses, uh, saw firsthand that uh, many, I want to comment down DBIA are doing a fantastic job meeting the public health guidelines with social distancing. But I did report to the health unit, in fact, a few businesses who were not following any proper guidelines I could, in fact, witness or see. I went in there myself, and all I can say it was horrendous. When I contacted uh, Mr. Larmer in terms of bylaw or Cobra Police Services, what could be done? Uh, the answer was rather a polite one. Well, we could go in and ask them nicely. 
And I said, well, why don't you have a mechanism at hand that you could use? And the message I received back quite bluntly and fairly was, well, you didn't have this in order, so we don't have any enforcement abilities within our kit. In other words, we can't really do anything, and I can't even follow up on health board can, but we can't within our municipality. And yet sometimes there were blatant disregard for the public health regulations. And for that reason, I over time have changed my mind because um, I see so many wonderful examples, and I wanna stress this in our community, but it's not a patchwork. We all have to be doing it. So for that reason, I feel it's only fair uh, that we give this kind of authority to our bylaw and to our Cobra Police Services. And I do really trust that they'll use the judgments fairly and honorably as they have been doing. If I listen carefully to I be, uh, Chief Vandergraaff, I believe he indicated they've only had three charges on individuals around the, the, the uh, beach or the park area and only one in the downtown core since this has started. I consider that honorable and fair. And I guess my message is I trust they'll continue with the education, but the good news if proponents do not follow that education, then I believe now we'll give them the tools that they can actually enforce the physical or social distancing bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Darling. Um, thank you. Just a clarification, if I could, from Mr. Larmer. Uh, when I read Mr. Larmer's report, um, I interpreted that uh, the last revision by the province, I, I don't have it printed out in front of me, Regulation 10420, if my memory serves me correctly, um, stated that they did make reference in that legislation to um, physical distancing and that now it is a provincial offense which we can charge for, which our bylaw can charge for. Is that correct? So um, do you, Mr. Chair, to the member, members of council, so there's a few things have changed since April 27th um, and, and Councillor Darling's on the right track and he's got the regulation rights better than I am. Um, it is 10420. Um, so there's been a few amendments to the regulations. And um, if you want, if you just bear with me, I've done some additional just uh, uh, updated information um, just for because there has been a just change and I've been keeping an eye on the changes since um, April 27th as this could have been brought forward at any time. Um, so basically um, there's been secondary source information for the government as they start to reopen um, their framework for the province and some of them have to do with um, municipal property and, and municipally owned areas um, that they've recently has closed prior um, to May 19th. Um, as the start of this emergency, they've, they've constantly have used the, the terminology from the health unit, which is maintain physical distance six feet, two meters. I think that's all in our heads now um, as a process for that. Um, the first time ever they have introduced in their new amendments to 10420 and 8220, um, actually including special provisions in those regulations related to physical distancing of two meters. But consistently, the province has left out um, in their um, kind of provincial legislation any reference to municipal parks as a whole or municipal beaches. Those have been consistently let out. What they have done is they've provided direct um, regulations related to specific indoor outdoor sports facilities under the place of non essential business closures under 8220 um, as well as when they amended the outdoor closure of recreational amenities they've added sports outdoor recreational amenities to that and what happens is that on May 19th they included in the regulation mandatory physical distance of at least two meters this is exempting members of the same household in a required outdoor sports amenities, off-leash dog parks, and picnic sites, benches, and shelters, and parks. So there's provincial legislation for those two meters, sorry, six feet, two meters, if physical exemption, and outdoor sports amenities as defined in the actual regulation, which includes multi-use uh, sports fields. So 
this might capture some areas in publicly owned public spaces like parks and the beach, but it doesn't cover the whole of the jurisdiction, nor does it cover any other public, you know, sidewalks, those areas or any other thing or in stores or jurisdiction wide. They're very specific in the regulations for that. Um, if I can, I, I looked up a, a few different municipalities related to physical distancing bylaws and a lot of them have their own interpretation on it. Um, so City of Toronto, you know that they've passed it. And what they've done is they've included six feet, two meter distance from people's in public parks and squares and these public open spaces. Um, so they've left out some of the businesses, the public businesses, those things in those areas they've included, which council has the full jurisdiction to do through bylaws, regulate any spaces they feel they need to, other than what's already provincially regulated because provincial legislation will always trump any municipal bylaws over anything. Um, other cities in Ottawa and Hamilton, um, city of Hamilton, um, they do it apply to all public property. So similar to, our bylaw, um, all public property, as well as publicly open spaces, the definition. So, for example, um, a grocery store has discussed previously and mentioned in our report um, that they exempt employees of the businesses, but customers are still have to maintain a six feet um, um, apart and two meters. Um, and then you have other areas that are, are still complementing this um this process just like we are so city of Sudbury has brought one forward and delayed that um, other Muskoka municipalities on their beaches in those areas but um they've put in something that will be brought forward if it does get out of hand or seen those processes um, that need to come forward and for that so hopefully that provides like brief clarification but there is specific legislation um that is referenced that has physical distance so for example if a couple of kids are or are fam or non-family but some people group of People get together and they start kicking a ball um, on a sports facility like um, like a, a soccer pitch um, and they're not maintaining the physical distance, um, um, then they could be charged on the EP, EMPCA. I should say all adults, um, young persons are different, whole different ball game when it comes to legislation, but um, they would be covered under the provincial legislation. Um, and there's people walking the beach or walking our sidewalk that aren't maintaining the physical distance. Um, we couldn't charge them. We could only suggest it to them. Um, so that that's the difference in that process hopefully explained it okay thank you mr larmer i that's a good clarification i was under the impression that the ontario regulation covered everything thank you uh councillor chorley yeah thank you councillor burkett um for me this is a question of proportionality the question i'm asking myself is is this a reasonable and proportionate use of coercive power because this is a coercive measure. The idea that we could be giving out tickets of $300 and $600 for a lack of social distancing. I ask really, is this proportionate to the situation that we are facing? There might be the odd case of people who are not respecting social distancing recommendations, but from what I understand from the town's own communications that have been going out on social media, there have been thank yous to the public for, for maintaining social distancing. Um, three charges along the waterfront and one charge in the downtown area from the Coburg police doesn't tell me that we have a serious problem on our hands. Hearing from the health unit earlier this evening, we have 185,000 individuals in our health unit. We only have 17 cases here in this area and most of them are resolved. So is it proportionate for us to restrict people's civil liberties in this way, given the situation that we're facing? I don't feel that it is a proportionate use of coercive power. I think having looked at other municipalities that have implemented similar bylaws, there have been all kinds of questions and potential problems, um, concerns and allegations of racial profiling in the implementation of these kind of rules. And that's something I don't want to see us get into here, even the, the possibility of that in our community. There have also been challenges and questions raised in terms of civil liberties. I know the Canadian Civil Liberties Association has been very outspoken on this and said that they literally said, we will be, with, we will be calling for an amnesty on all these tickets 
and that all the fines be forgiven afterwards because of the unconstitutional mess that many municipal governments have put us into. And that's a direct quotation from Executive Director Michael Bryant. And I would just note that Michael Bryant is a former Attorney General of Ontario. Um, we heard from Tamara earlier this evening, raising similar concerns about civil liberties in her delegation. So I think we need to be very cautious about moving forward with these kind of restrictions and these kind of penalties. And finally, I just want to direct a quick question to Mr. Larmer. Um, for those with disabilities, how would this bylaw be enforceable between carers and residents in retirement homes, detention facilities, or those with physical or mental disabilities who require a PSW? The way this bylaw is written, technically they would need to maintain social distancing or else they could be ticketed. And how is it enforceable in any customer service setting, such as a grocery store or pharmacies? Uh, Mr. Larmer, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, through um, you, Chair, just to um, provide some information on, I think, what Councillor Charlie might be referencing as a support worker, someone that needs an assistance of somebody. Um, those are actually um, part of the Accessibility for Terrorists with Disabilities Act. So any individual that needs a caregiver or someone to to use a walker or go out or, or those things. It's just like getting on a public bus, we would be exempt from getting charged for that as a support worker. So um, I just wanna make it very, very clear that our Coburg Police Services, I can't speak for them, but our bylaw enforcement services, um, we have a number of bylaws that are regulating bylaws that we are consistently giving education on um, and consistently providing information to. Um, and you can see this from my report from the previous meeting um, with bylaw enforcement stats. All of those were warnings and education purposes. The minute that individuals start to become an issue, which can happen on occasion, but most people are pretty susceptible to enforcement services that we that we usually get compliance. It's usually that odd one out that will fight and will provide an issue or create something of a concern to bylaw enforcement. And those would be under their discretion and authority to issue the fine if needed. That being said, I just wanted to make it clear that um, we, we have these in force and effect, but we make sure that we judge every, every situation on its own merit and whether or not, A, they, can, they are committing the offense that it is, B, that we provide compliance and education and they are well aware that they might be in a fraction and whether they will correct that action or not. And, and, and C, every opportunity to, to um, rectify that. If not, the last resort will be getting issued a ticket. And uh, Council Chorley is correct. The public has been very good um, at, at listening and, 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 and providing that um, correction in their regulatory, their actions. Um, within Colbert, but we do consistently, as you can see from the reports, sometimes have to use that, that restriction. Um, at the start of the, this pandemic, um, a lot of the, the areas, the grocery stores, which I think are those, 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 those areas were kind of learning curves on physical distancing. And I have to admit that uh, they, they weren't that great at it at the start. And we had a number of complaints coming in about not physical distancing stores, not adhering to that. But we provide correction to that and we've talked to them. Um, I would say uh, three or four times a month we receive complaints still to the public that um, physical distancing is not being respected at different places within the community that are publicly accessible. So um, we do track that as well. Um, so we would never enforce anything on anyone without providing that compliance education first and it's a last resort, but an extra toolbox in our, in, in our gamut in order to use to make sure everyone's um, safe, healthy, and, and complying to those um, restrictions that are in place that, um, you know, we have, I just wanna make a side note that, you know, we have a lot of these physical distancing signs. We use it in our communications. We're constantly using it, but as we well are aware, if there's no mechanism for enforcement, then they're just words. And when the province of Ontario is including some of these physical distance sections and certain provisions and facilities and sports recreations, then, um, obviously, they have, you know, 
reason to believe that these are effective. So um, that's why kind of these would be another tool in order to assist our, our enforcement officers, a tool that the council of the day can remove whenever they wish. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. I hope that answered your questions, Councillor Chorley. Uh, I believe Councillor Bureau had uh, something and then uh, we'll go back to you, Councillor Darling. Um, I agree with Councillor Chorley and she said everything probably way more eloquently than I will, <laughs> especially at this time of night. Um, a lot of those infractions that were in the report uh, we're from the beach in the park area. Um, now that we've closed the beach, uh, we still have the provincial, if, if, if I heard you correctly, the provincial thing, if the provincial act would allow to give fines for in the parks and stuff like that, right? On municipal property, the provincial act does, correct, Mr. Larmer? Um, you mean regarding physical distancing? Right. Yeah, so like I used the example, any of the ones that are actually in the act, we can charge that for. So, so there was 193 infractions in total for the, or warnings for the month of May. And all that had to do with the, the beach and the parks. So to me, we've taken care of the problem of the beach. We also have the provincial act that if there's people that are crowding the beach, we can give them a much more substantial fine if it was the last resort. Um, as far as out in the community, uh, in private and uh, private residences and, and businesses, there is still the provincial act because uh, the police did lay charges, three of them. And I do think that our, our citizens are doing quite well on social distancing. And I'm not saying that we we um, we need this now because I don't think we do, but. I'm willing to defer this and then bring it up in the next, uh, not next round of council sessions, the round after to see if we actually need this or not. I just think that uh, at this time, we don't need it. I don't know how we would enforce it. Um, I, I, I would, other. I mean, how would, the other question I would have is how would you know that a group of five or six people isn't living in the same in the same house? Even though their ID may have different addresses, they could, I mean, it's very easy to say, well, you know, we're all, since COVID, we're all out of work, we're all living together. And because we didn't want to be alone. I mean, it, to me, that's more of a, a, a police state going up and, and asking for everybody's ID as, as the way it's written. So I think the provincial rules to me are enough, but I'm willing to defer this to the, I can't, maybe to the first, council meeting in July. So that's my opinion. Are, are you putting a motion on the floor? Or, or Ms. Mr. Larmer, do you have a comment first? Yeah, I just want to, if you can, Chair, just provide some clarification related to the comments from Councillor Bureau. Um, just regards to what I referenced with the fines on the beach, um, all I was reporting in that, it was the infractions that are on the beach that I was as asked to do. All I was doing is referencing in my prior statements that um, we do constantly give warnings and then we charge. It was an example of a fine. Um, for example, dogs on the beach, right? We give lots and lots of warnings. Um, then we issued the ticket. Um, we got over 100 warnings for dogs on the beach. So a similar situation, physical distancing. We'd work, 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 education, compliance. Um, then if necessary, we would issue that fine. So it's a, another, Just I just provide an example of a separate bylaw or another bylaw that we could charge under. Um, the additional comment, I want to make sure it's very clear that this bylaw does not go into a private dwelling, nor would it ever, this has nothing to do with private residents, and nor is there any provincial regulations um, that require or the police can charge for, or us, to enter a dwelling for six meter to two, two feet apart. There is no such law, and this bylaw does not cross into the private household, as well as members of the same household are exempt, so there's no reason to do that. Um, I also want to make mention that the charges laid by the police had nothing to do with physical distancing charges. They had separate charges related to the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act outside of physical distancing. So there was no or has been no charges related to physical distancing at all. Those are separate instances on the EMPCA. I just wanted to provide those 
um, clarifications and in addition to um, the enforcement of such bylaw, um, you're right, the officers would not know who's from the house and we would never cart. The only time that we ask for identification is when an infraction is being committed or the likelihood of, or that the investigation will lead to um, a, a, a citation. That was the only time we will ask for identification um, for that. Usually these past weekends um, that we have talked, so just this last week when we had a group of 15 people come down and, and be on the beach, um, our officers will talk to them and almost, I would say almost 98% of the time, the group will admit to us that they're not part of it when the conversations happen. So a lot of times we can get it through the investigation and the training that we provide our officers. I can't speak to the police, but um, they have a good ability to make that necessary as well as they have the tools and education in order to know how to enforce any bylaws or provincial legislation that is enriched by the province or by the town. And we would handle that. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. Um, okay, so I, I will put a motion to defer then. Oh, oh. before that, do, is it okay if we just take a comment from Councillor Darling? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I just need to, some clarification from Mr. Larmer, and again, with the uh, provincial regulation. If we have somebody come to town or or locals even, and they go to the West Beach and they're not social distancing, can they be charged under the provincial regulation at this time? The West Beach or Victoria Park or Donegan Park? Uh, through you, For, Chair. Through social Robert. distancing. Do you, Chair. Social the distancing on that. Go ahead. Sorry, okay, Mr. Larmer. Do you, Chair, to the member of council, um, no, they wouldn't be able to be charged in the physical um, if they're on West Beach and they weren't from the same household, um, they were together, um, they couldn't be charged under the provincial legislation because there is none. The provincial legislation is very specific to recreational amenities and outdoor okay. sports amenities under the Act. So That's no, what I wanted to clarify. Yeah, they wouldn't be able to be charged for that. No. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Is that uh, all? Uh, is it a, que a question before uh, Councillor Chorley? Before it's really just a follow up on the comment just made by Mr. Larmer. Um, and my question was to clarify, but individuals can still be charged for the five person rule, assembling five people or more. And that applies to private dwellings as well. That's correct. And also I just wanted to mention, there is the, um, also from the health unit, I'm just gonna pull this up. On April 14th, um, our district health unit issued a class order under section 22 of the Health Protection and Promotion Act. And that requires people to self-isolate if they've actually been diagnosed with COVID-19, if they're awaiting their test results, or they've been in close contact with those individuals. And that's targeted mandatory measure to curb the spread of the virus. That's the kind of measure I can support that is gonna have a, a real tangible impact on curbing the spread of the virus. Social distancing is a good recommendation. For the most part, people are following it, but I don't think we need to enforce that and impose fines on the public right now, especially when people are facing financial hardship. Okay. Uh, Councillor Darling, one more thing, and then yeah, we'll just, go. Um, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Councillor Biro in the motion to defer this until like we look at the uh, the report back from staff regarding uh, the beach. If we decide to open it and, uh, you know, whether we square it off or whether we allow X number of people and we ask them to social distance, then I think we'll need to have something in place. But again, um, I sort of agree with Councillor Chorley in that it's not a real, real big issue in town now. And we have stepped on or you know, set aside a lot of civil liberties. So if we could look at addressing this when the report comes back to council in a few weeks time. So I would be in support of, of a motion by Councillor Bureau if he wishes so to defer this until we uh, make a decision on the beach and whether we really do need to social distance people or physically distance them on the beach. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> 
Thank you, Councillor Darling. I think that's the best solution uh, tonight because we've thrown a lot at this community tonight with the closing of the beach. And we all read an awful lot of uh, emails the last week or so. And uh, I really do trust the people that live in this town. I trust that they will, I mean, I, I support our bylaw officers and I know Mr. Larmer has worked hard on this, but I think that's the best solution. Let's Sorry, I've been gabbing on and on and nobody heard me. Um, uh, I think that's the best solution, uh, Councillor Darling. Um, we basically have thrown a lot at this community in the last, tonight we've closed the beach and we're putting up fencing. And I think uh, most of the people that live here, honest law abiding citizens. And if we had seen, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of potential uh, physical distancing infractions. I've seen kids on the skateboard park, you know, there's five or six of them, there's five or 10 of them. I've seen roofers trying to put a roof together. I've seen all kinds of instances. We've got to be fair to the people that live here. We've got to give them an opportunity to, to do what they need to do best and that's to keep our town safe. So I think um, Councillor Bureau, if you wanted to put your motion to defer, till the 22nd um, meeting where we have a good report from council or from staff, then we can make a, an evidence-based decision on this issue. I don't think tonight's the night to do it. All right, um, is that okay, Council? So, uh, Council Bureau, if you would like to put a motion forward to defer. Motion to defer the social distancing bylaw to June 22nd, Committee of the Whole. All councillors clear on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, it's carried. I uh, thank you, Councillor Burkett, uh, for that wonderful discussion from all members of council. Uh, Mr. Larmer, I believe we're back to you. Yes, sir. Getting my act together here. Uh, oops, sorry, I apologize. It's, a it's all right. You did a great meeting. job. Okay, Your Worship, next we have unfinished business and all the items are listed on the agenda. If there's any questions from members of council? Are there any questions to Mr. Larmer? Uh, seeing none, then Mr. Larmer uh, were to open form. Uh, can you comment accordingly? Yes, Your Worship, we have received one um, open form submission and it's actually um, um, from uh, Miriam Mouton in regards to the Golden Plow Lodge. I believe all the council have seen this, but Miriam would like to read at the open forum meeting. So I will provide that to you. Um, hello, Mayor and members of council. I've been following the process of the new building of the Golden Plow Lodge and submitted comments to the county further to a presentation by the design team to county council on February 20th, 2019. In addition, I am thankful of the proactive measures the county continues to undertake to keep serious living at GP, to keep seniors living at GPL safe during these times of COVID-19. The design of the new Golden Plow Lodge hopefully will be also assessed with a view how to ensure quality of life for residents during times of outbreak and lockdown, which could go on for months during a pandemic. For example, even in non-pandemic times, in-house facilities and staff to enable internet supportive FaceTime with families should be considered as essential. The attachment is my submission to the county from last year for your information. I've also sent most recent email samples below. From my perspective, an item still needing an answer relates to sun shade diagrams for the courtyards. How much sun will touch the ground? Keep in mind the surrounding building is not one story in height, but typically three. In addition, it is the view out of the resident rooms. Example, ample screening of parking lots, utility spaces of adjacent properties. That is more important than the view in from the parking lots. Why do these things matter? 
because even non-pandemic times, I've been told that staff are not permitted to take residents to areas outside the buildings. As a result, residents who are not able to go outside on their own or have family to take them outside, many get stuck inside a lot of the time. For example, most activities are held indoors. And this big one regarding healthcare, internal dentistry service that allows local practitioners, including dental hygiene. Other examples of correspondence for me, an email to the county CAO on January 6, 2020, and further to ask any update on plans for the new GBL in part. I'm especially interested in several aspects like the nature of operable windows and resident rooms, the main street details, connectivity of the site to active transportation networks, and sun slash shade diagrams for outdoor recreation areas. My dad's doctor suggests that 20 minutes of sunshine a day is good for skin health. On June 27, 2019, I wrote to the newly appointed director of the Thumbland Community Health Corporation in part. Please keep in mind the potential for retrofit of the existing GPL for repurposing as affordable co-housing with the new Golden Plow Lodge care home is built. Presently, the county proposal is to tear the existing building down and landscape the site for parkland. I attach my submission on comments for the view of GPL building. Refer to item six for the general comment to request investigation, investigation of options for the existing building. In closing, the new Golden Pile Lodge is a great idea and a great project. Considerations for the nature of the world we are living in today will make an even better project. Miriam. Okay, thank you, Mr. Larmer uh, for that. Is there any other um, open forum from any members of the media to you at this point in time? No, Your Worship, that's it. That's all I've received prior to um, the start of the meeting, which is a little bit delayed. So they had a little bit more time, but I didn't receive anything after that. Okay, thank you. I believe that brings us to the wonderful word of adjournment. <laughs> I see lots of hands. Uh, Deputy Mayor Seguin, all in favor? approved and again i'd like to thank uh mr larmer for the work he did in preparation for tonight's in particular special meeting and uh, the dialogue that did take place it uh, was well done by all members of council and again a credit to our community it was a long day for all of us uh, a very good day and tomorrow we'll continue to move forward so thank you everyone i don't think you have much time left of your evening but do enjoy perhaps uh, what's left. And to senior staff, Mr. Davey, thank you for the work of the directors uh, to, to be with us in this journey. I appreciate it. Mr. Larmer, great kudos because I know how many submissions you made each time additions were being made to the agenda uh, 